All right, I'm actually, I'm gonna do the mic. All right. Um, those of you who have been my students know I probably don't need it, but I'm gonna do it. Okay. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for being here, and thank you again um, for the faculty and staff who put this together. I was talking to a student earlier and said, this is kind of like planning a little baby wedding, um, where you, there's a lot of pieces that you have to put together, and then you think everything's fine, and then on the day, you're still kind of running around. So I, if you've seen me today, I've been running around. Um, uh, and thank, again, thank you again to the Association of Legal Writing Directors for the speaker series, um, it's a distinguished speaker series grant um, to be able to bring Ruth Ann here. Um, I'm going to be uh, telling a story in a minute about me and Ruth Ann. I felt it was appropriate considering that the, one of the major themes today will be storytelling. So the Law Goes Pop is an idea I had. Um, I've been interested in the intersection between law and pop culture for a long time. I use it in my class when I teach lawyering skills. My students know we, we deal with Sherlock Holmes. Um, we play card games. We do all kinds of things um, because of the importance of uh, pop culture in learning in that it creates a bridge between what is unknown and what is known and it has been studied at length um, to show that it is a very formidable teaching tool. Um, but the other thing that made me interested was the intersection between law and pop culture is its own discipline, really. It is a thing, as Ruth Ann said this to me this morning. It is a thing. Um, and as we will explore today, there is an interplay between the way we live our lives on the day-to-day -day and what we consume in media, how we talk to each other, um, on social media, and the law. And the interplay um, often is studied in how law influences pop culture, which will be our first panel. And it is very important to see how our legal institutions get translated into common understanding. But as panel two will discuss, pop culture also influences the law. And we're seeing that in the um, in podcasts, we see it on TikTok, we see it in documentary series, that the law can be impacted by pop culture. And so that's what the second panel will be exploring. But the other piece of this, and the thread that's gonna run through both directions, how law and pop culture influence each other, is storytelling. That is how pop culture has been influencing the law. If you think about the podcast Serial, that was a story that was told that made people change the way they thought about a particular case. Um, but it is much broader than that, and that is um, the main reason why I thought of bringing in Ruth Ann Robbins. Um, Ruth Ann Robbins um, is a, a rock star, absolutely a preeminent scholar in legal storytelling. Um, and uh, I met Ruth Ann, I'll tell the story first and then I'll give the rest of your accolades, how's that? I met Ruth Ann, <laughs> um, Ruth Ann and I have been friends for a long time. Um, and we first really knew each other. We both teach uh, lawyering skills or legal writing, and there are a lot of conferences that um, are discipline-building conferences that we would that happen one the summer and then throughout the year. So I had seen Ruth Ann. I obviously knew of Ruth Ann, um, but when we first really like knew each other, I think was a conference. Do you know the year? Oh, okay, <laughs> she doesn't, you will, um, she, she'll figure out the story, um, is when I saw Ruth Ann give a presentation, I think in an LWI conference, at the TED Talk, 2016. Um, Ruth Ann gave a, a presentation about giving a TED Talk um, and the usefulness of presenting in that way and kind of deconstructed what a TED Talk does, but she did it through um, the mythology of Glinda the Good Witch from The Wizard of Oz. And um, I read all those books as a child. I didn't just see the movies. I read all the books probably multiple times. And so one of the things that Ruth Ann talked about in the, her presentation was that Glinda is misportrayed in the movies as being this like pink, fluffy, and in Wicked too, sorry everybody, um, that, um, that Glinda is actually, does not wear pink. She wears white, she has an army, she has a magic book that tells her everything that happens in the world and she reads it every day. She's a scholar, she's a warrior and just the, how she had been kind of softened for public consumption. But I knew those things about Glinda, so of course after Ruth Ann's talk, I'm like, I know all about Glinda, and then we were best friends. Um, so Ruth and I have been friends through a story, um, through the story of Glinda the Good Witch and how that story can be changed, um, depending on the interests of the people telling the story. Um, and after that, I had also, a, I don't think I was an editor yet, but I applied to be an editor 
for um, Legal Communication and Rhetoric, which is a legal writing peer-reviewed publication uh, through the Association of Legal Writing Directors. And um, I uh, was an associate editor, which means for all you law review students, I did the below the line work primarily. I was the 2L um, doing that work, so I feel you. Um, and then after a year of doing that, Ruth Ann asked me if I wanted to apply to be a co-editor in chief with her. And I said, I'm literally at the bottom rung of the ladder and you want me to go and like, won't people not like that? And she said, no one wants to do this. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I did and so Ruth Ann and I got to be co-EICs for a couple of years and we got to edit articles together and work on the mission and all of that. Um, and again, a lot of the articles dealing with storytelling and eventually I got to start writing in this area. I got, you know, got to learn about it through writing it. So just to keep getting into legal storytelling and the importance of it, it is a discipline. Um, LCNR is the primary publisher for legal storytelling, how it impacts not just you as learning the law, but how lawyers use storytelling in their profession. And they can use it in the obvious ways, like telling your client's story, telling a statement of facts, an opening statement. But we actually have articles that talk about how a contract can be a legal story. So it works its way in in a lot of different areas. Um, so that is the backdrop of why I wanted to put this together. I will just finish very briefly talking a little bit more about Ruth Ann so I can give her accolades. She wrote her own bio, so she didn't highlight some of the things I would like to highlight about her. Um, like I said, she's a preeminent scholar. She's written books and articles. I do have your book, I promise. Um, and one of her most recent article published in LCNR was called Fiction 102. She wrote Fiction 101, which was the importance of elements of storytelling like plot and character. But Fiction 102 talks about the concept of story worlds. And I won't get too much into it because I know you're going to want to. But this idea of the setting and the actions in a story and how, how persuasive they are. And that is the, other, the main piece of legal storytelling that we're going to see today is that stories persuade. Um, they trigger something in us that is fundamental as, as humans about that we view the world through stories. And so it can be a very persuasive tool for a variety of reasons. Um, and Ruth Ann is an expert in understanding and probing how and why those reactions occur. Uh, the other books that she has written recently are, are in the process. One is called Threshold Concepts in Legal Writing. That is still in the editing stage. And then the other one is Your Client's Story. So again, legal storytelling and how to um, be a lawyer that understands the stories that surround us all when we talk to our clients and when we talk to courts and when we talk to each other. So I'll leave it there because there are so many wonderful speakers today and I want to give as much time as possible for them to be able to explore these ideas. We do welcome questions at, at, at multiple points, so I hope that we can get a good discussion going with everybody. Thank you for coming and I hope you really enjoy today. So just like an advocate, I've got my timer ready to go so that I can time myself on these things. So if any of you are doing the court, you probably know that technique. So hello, thank you for being here. I know that some of you are here because you may be receiving extra credit or perhaps you were guilt tripped by your professor. And some of you may be interested um, in this. I hope that I'm interesting no matter what. I also see that there's a young person here. Um, thanks for being here also. Um, as Dr. Sweeney said, um, the, the way that we respond to pop culture is the way that we respond to stories. And we love stories. As humans, we are programmed from birth to respond to stories. We recognize faces first. Um, toddlers want stories read to them over and over. They get dressed up and they live their stories. And it's because we are storytelling creatures. And so it really makes sense to start talking about why stories matter in law. Stories matter because we are here as lawyers to represent clients, whether the client is an individual, a corporation, an organization, the population of a jurisdiction, it's all the same. They're stories that are being lived. 
And so with that, I'm going to try and figure out what we're doing here. Okay. So that's why we're talking first about storytelling to set this framework. And of course, the first thing we need to do is what is a story anyway? And so, oops, we're going to go back. Story is a descriptive telling of a character's efforts over time to overcome obstacles and reach a goal. Now, that's not the only definition of story that's out there, but it's a pretty simple one. And you know that we can break this down into elements. The central part of a story is there's a character, at least one character. The character could be a rock, but that rock is probably going to have some kind of animation to it that makes it feel more human. And a story has to have the passage of time because the character, the main character, has some kind of obstacle that they are facing and trying to overcome to get to whatever they're supposed to be getting to, right? And there's description that's part of it. And I bring this up is that story involves time, but it also involves what's called a narrative flow that shows up in all of our writing, regardless of whether we're writing legal analysis or the actual statement of a case or something like that. There has to be cause and effect. Something happens, and therefore, something happens. But then, something happens, so therefore, something happens. That's what a story is. And all of this, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about law, whether we're talking about pop culture, it's all the same. What's also the same is that our clients, um, or in pop culture, the characters all fit into an archetype. And so there, there's about a dozen of them that have been identified, um, and they all have different conflicts that they're trying to overcome. You are all on multiple heroic archetype journeys right now. If you're a law student, you're here as a sage. You're trying to learn things to overcome that ultimate challenge of the bar exam. But you may also, at home, be a caregiver. Maybe you're taking care of family members. Maybe you're taking care of a cat or a dog or another pet. Who we choose our clients to be in a lawsuit, in a legislative initiative, in a contract, depends on matching the archetype to whatever the legal situation is. And in pop culture, you can see that um, we cast the main character in one of these roles. So just to give you a couple of quick ones, I mean, it's pretty obvious what a creator hero is if we're talking about Taylor Swift. But if we're talking about something like an orphan hero, it doesn't have to be a literal orphan. It can be anybody who's been cut off from their society. So in the other work that I do, which is domestic violence, um, legislative initiatives, um, and I have done restraining order hearings, generally we represent survivors as orphans. They've been cut off from their society and through a restraining order, they're trying to regain society. And that's usually sort of the best theory of the case that we can do. We stay away from something like the innocent as an archetype because that's really reserved for people who are in a childlike state, either because they are children or because they've um, suffered some kind of catastrophic um, injury that renders them unable to make their own decisions or something like that. But we're not going to cast somebody who has been charged with a crime as an innocent unless they're you know, five years old. Most of the time we would cast them as something like the caregiver at home who happened to steal the loaf of bread or whatever it is. Um, but we have to be careful about that. And yes, um, for you, Joanna put in Glinda as the magician hero. Okay, so, but just knowing the character doesn't really help us uh, understand how a story engages us. And it doesn't really answer the question of how stories persuade. Thanks for turning off, Joanne. Um, OK, so knowing the character doesn't answer the question. Stories call to us because characters experience emotions that we, as the story experiencer, can comprehend and can shadow. So this affects us in a way that a syllogism does not. 
narrative reasoning, which is one of the major types of reasoning, including in legal reasoning, it's not just the telling of the tale, but the tale's organization, again, as cause and effect flow, which is different than presenting facts um, through a chronology or as a syllogism. So what happens when we experience a story? Well, we enter something called the story world. We actually transport. And it, this psychologist is called narrative transportation. It's the act of being drawn into the story. And this has been proved through a number of psychological studies. Um, and what we, they discover, and we also have a lot of metaphors for this. I was lost in story, I lost track of time, I really got into this book, um, something like that. When we read a story, we engage it by leaving where we are and traveling into the world of the story. We, especially if we're reading a story, we combine our own mental images from our own experiences or from things we've watched or read in the past, combined with the one that the author has created for us. And so we're actually engaging in the act of creating that story world, and it's very powerful from a psychological perspective. Inside that world, we temporarily lose connection to our own world, and some of the things in our own world become inaccessible. And so here's an example. When I went to see the movie Wonder Woman, me and my family happened to be sitting like right on top of speakers. And so we could feel the vibration. It was really bothering us during the previews. And we're like, do we have to move? Are we going to have to leave? What are we going to do? And then the movie started. And we didn't feel it anymore. The vibrations went away. And we started feeling them again when the credits were rolling. And it was really obvious to us that we had left the theater and had entered. And it's not like Wonder Woman was a quiet movie, right? It's a pretty loud movie. Um, and so that's an example. We shadow these characters in the story and we feel something they're feeling. We adopt their norms and whatever their laws are. Think about watching a horror movie. You're not in danger. But when you see the characters are in danger, you feel anxious. The music helps. Right? And maybe we jump when the characters are startled. There's nobody there to startle us, but we are actually right next to the character in the story. And so this narrative transportation creates connection between us and between the story characters, and that's how the persuasion happens. Because we've adopted their norms and their laws. And we make their belief system our belief system temporarily. And it's, we feel safe doing that because we know that experiencing a story is temporary. So it's OK for us to put down whatever our biases or our beliefs or our understanding is and to just be in that world and accept that world as what it is. This happens regardless of whether we're reading fiction or nonfiction. And so. We can come back from that story changed. We have, because we have seen something from another person's perspective, we may have opened ourselves up and become more flexible to accepting things that a syllogism may not allow us to see. So, why are they persuasive? Because they can reinforce what we believe or they can change what they believe. By suspending our disbelief and adopting those norms and the laws, we've actually jumped over the cognitive resistance that we have when we're presented with logical arguments. Now, this may seem a little unsettling to us as lawyers, where we think everything is a logical argument. But this is what the psychologists have found. We don't question the premise of the story world. We don't engage what a clinician might call methodological doubt, like where we automatically start creating counter arguments. We just are there experiencing. Cognitive psychologists have been studying this for a couple of decades. We just, I think it's appropriate for me to give major names. So there's Dr. Richard Garrick, Dr. Melanie C. Green, Dr. Timothy C. Brock, and others 
have been studying this persuasive assist of narrative transportation. And Drs. Green and Brock describe this, I'm gonna read what they say, as a distinct mental process that melds attention, imagery, and affective, meaning feeling response. And they distinguish the cognitive persuasion, what they call advocated opinions, you, that should sound familiar to you, um, or rhetorical persuasion, which rely on arguments that are backed up by claims and evidence. So what we lawyers would say is that narrative persuasion operates differently than logical persuasion. And there's realism to, to narrative transportation. We believe in these stories because we've been experiencing them our whole lives. So we avoid, as I said, that methodological doubt and allows us instead to engage in what Peter Elbow would call methodological belief, where we just accept and say, well, what happens if the world is like that? As story experiencers, we're not really assessing a story for accuracy, but for what Catherine Page would call verisimilitude. That is the lifelikeness of the situation. So what, the key, what is key is the audience says that they're engaging in this world of their own free will. They're not forced to it, but if they're there experiencing, they might believe that Hogwarts is real or that Barbie world is real. Um, and so we're willing to engage in those new ideas because we know it's temporary. So does that mean that we as lawyers should abandon syllogistic reasoning? No, of course not. What it means is that in addition to learning syllogistic logical reasoning, we also need to be learning storytelling techniques. And so what storytelling te techniques matter? Description matters. We've got to understand what it is we describe and how we describe and how some description is more important than other. And I'm sorry, I'm just gonna check my time for one second, which is going to involve me opening up my phone. Okay, I'm fine. So what goes into some good storytelling? Well, these are the only things that could be described. And if you ever watched um, Schoolhouse Rock, that old stuff that's on TV, you know it's a noun, a person, place, or thing. Right, settings, actions, objects, characters. Those are the four things that we describe. And the way that we describe them is through details. The name of something, the function of something. Oh, this is a water bottle. It exists to hydrate people. The history of the development of water bottles would be another way we could describe it. It used to be that they were all flip tops and had those little tabs on them that we would break our nails or our fingers trying to get them open. Um, so we could describe it that way. The sensory information, okay, this is about this tall, it's about as big as a foot, right? It's cylindrical, um, there's a blue cap on it, it cap is blue, but the bottle is clear, all of that kind of stuff. Analogy, right? It's filled with water. Does water taste like chicken? No, water does not taste like, but that, like that. So you all know analogical reasoning. Um, of these, for storytelling to really work, for narrative transportation to work, it's the settings and the actions that really matter to get us there. And so um, I will tell my students that setting plus action equals scene. It's the scenes that matter. And a scene can drop us in really fast. Okay, how many people have seen this movie? Great! Tell me, what's going on here? So, okay, somebody in the back. Right, but do you know exactly where she is in the movie and what she's doing? Like, what's this? Does anybody remember? So, she does definitely drive the car, but this is actually from earlier in the movie. Does anybody... Yes, that's when she's speaking to people. Hey, Barbie, right. Does anybody remember this particular one? Pilot in the sky, right? So she remembered. Okay, so 
Very good. And so you, but you had to go back into the movie to think, what was she doing for that? Pilot in the sky. Now that we have the exact scene, do all, how, did all of you go back into your memories and go, oh yeah, I remember when she did that to the pilots in the sky. Great. What color was the plane? You're all like, now you're on your computers looking it up. It was pink. I mean, easy guess, it was pink. All right. Okay. So those of you who like raised your hand and went, oh yeah, she was in Barbie world. We know instantly she's in Barbie world and we put ourselves back in Barbie world. So neuroimaging studies, and I want to point out here that there's some dis debate about the neuroimaging studies, but for those who believe in the neuroimaging studies and storytelling, Neuroimaging studies show that mental stimulation through imagery lights up the same areas of our brain used for actions that are being described. Even a single word can cause activities in the brain. So um, the test was done with a description of somebody playing soccer and scoring a goal. And so the parts of our brain that are mapped to running and kicking lit up in the brains of the people they were studying, showing that we actually imagine ourselves and we shadow the characters and that part of our brain lights up. And so for those of you who want to think about this, this is from Dr. Nicholas Spear, reading stories activates neural representation of visual and motor experiences. Um, so 28, Psychology Science, 989, a 2009 study. So it is really the, the actions that matter to us, but also the settings. We have to have a place to transport to. And we have to know what's going on in that world. <clears throat> so there are also studies that show that those of us who read sci-fi fantasy have an advantage in creating story worlds very fast in our mind when we are reading because in sci-fi and fantasy, we always have to create those worlds in our mind. You know, it's hard for us to look at an analogy on Earth of what Dune looked like or something like that. This was actually a really big deal when the Harry Potter movies were being made because so many people had created mental images that the people designing the set had to worry a lot about whether the set was going to match what they thought all the readers of the world had in their brain. They spent a lot of time talking about what people had imagined and whether the movie was going to match it. And so <clears throat> they were paying close attention to people's reactions to um, the early trailers that came out. Were people you know, breathing a sigh of relief or were they criticizing? And so for the most part, they were breathing a sigh of relief, but it was actually something that the set designers were studying. So let's talk about some of the other science that went into this because it relates to pop culture. So um, the cognitive science has been studied by people in marketing, which is the science behind advertising. And they used something like Instagram to test whether people um, were reacting to just somebody holding a product versus whether they were actually using the product. And they were using some bland products like bread and water to see how people reacted. And it, um, they measured it by how many likes people were giving on social media. And so this was a picture from the original study. Um, and then they did it again. And they were also testing for selfies versus LCs. And if you take nothing else away from today, you will learn that an LC is the opposite of a selfie. Um, and so what they discovered <laughs> is that um, it was the LC of somebody about to drink from the water bottle that had the most comments and the most interaction. So what does that tell us? That the using the product, the action mattered and also the setting because you have to have a place to transport to. So it's the duality of actions and settings. Again. All right. So, what is this? Who cares in law? Like, and why should anyone else sitting here today, not just for extra credit, because it matters when you are writing about this stuff and when you're talking about this stuff. And how much does it matter? You could do this in a few simple words, but you need to set a scene. 
right? The setting and the action matter when you're talking about something like a case you're reporting on, um, the reason behind a law that has been created or you're arguing for, and it might be something very simple that changes a scene in somebody's mind. And so, as an example, um, which I explained to one of your professors last night, was that I've seen this working, so in um, domestic violence restraining order cases, um, and I'll give you one example. So in one example, students were representing somebody who's seeking a restraining order based on the fact that she was scared when she was doing a custody exchange with the father of her child, and they had an argument, and then she said that um, the, the defendant and his family surrounded the car, and she felt very intimidated and scared, and it was scary. And the students came to me and said, like, how are we gonna get a restraining order for this? It doesn't seem like domestic violence. It doesn't seem intimidating at all. And we had to step back and say, okay, so the scene of the family surrounding the car she found intimidating. What are you picturing and what is she picturing? So I went back and said, tell me about the family that was surrounding the car. Well, it was 20 people in that family who were surrounding the car, right? The students, of course, had imagined three or four. Nope, it was an extended family. All of a sudden, the scene changes from simply saying 20 family members surrounded the car and she didn't feel she could leave. That's how few words it could take to make sure the setting is correct for the legal theory you need done. So a simple parenthetical in something like a slip and fall case can also really help. So I'm going to read you um, an example um, um, that this is a simulation that my, um, or case file simulation that my one else have used. Courts in this jurisdiction cast a wide net when confronting what constitutes a pavement hazard that gives rise to a commercial landowner's duty of care for their premises. On numerous occasions, courts have found a duty with respect to snow and ice on the pavement. Beyond snow and ice, courts have likewise deemed foreseeable and dangerous and therefore within a duty of care a number of other situations with a citation, parenthetical, wet leaves on a curve parenthetical, banana peel on sidewalk staircase, right? And so we can instantly get the scene from something as fast as a parenthetical. So this works, obviously, when we're talking about something like a memo or a brief. It also works um, when discussing legislation, which is also what I do at clinic students and so as an example, a year or so ago, New Jersey passed a law to give home, care, um, home health care workers special parking privileges in busy urban locales. The stories of these home health care workers persuaded the New Jersey legislature. It was stories that were as simple as um, they don't have a lot of money that they're earning and they're trying to get to their elderly patients um, and they have to walk long blocks late at night in inclement weather um, who had expensive parking tickets because they were just trying to get there in time or more likely because they stayed later to take care of these patients and now they go to their car and find a $60 parking ticket and that's happening night after night. Something as small as that kind of description can really um, be persuasive. So I'm just going to end with the ethics of it. Um, you've got to be careful. First of all, you gotta know that the timing is right, whether it's you know, in the world, is somebody susceptible to this kind of story, but also where in the document are you gonna tell it? And how are you gonna tell it? And you have to be careful that the details don't overwhelm. So stick to what you really need them to know and what you can generalize. But last, even um, the best told story can fail if you use the wrong words that set up the wrong image. So in domestic violence, if somebody talks about how they were um, pushed down the stairs, you gotta be careful of those verbs. Was it push? Was it shove? Was it thrown? You know, was it bumped into? 
you got to be super careful to make sure that you are not showing something that you can't actually prove with the evidence. And I think I'm going to end there so I don't cognitively overload you, but I hope that you can see why it is that stories persuade, how stories persuade, and what this all means for the rest of the conference. Thank you. And I, we have a couple minutes for questions. I don't know if anybody has any questions. <laughs> no questions. Oh, one question. Hi. Right. So um, evidence is there to make the story cohesive, right? So, and at the same time, the story has to be built around what evidence you have. So you cannot have one without the other, right? And so if facts are evidence that's been determined as facts, you gotta make sure that it works for your story. You can't tell a story of how somebody was punched if there is evidence that they were pinched. Right, so they absolutely, it's, um, it's a back and forth thing. Question. Right. So, I mean, that's all about ethos, right? And whether the um, other decision makers are going to be more persuaded by one of their own. I mean, if you can get one of the decision makers in a panel of decision makers to tell a story, then yes. I mean, their credibility, their ethos is always going to be more than the hired advocate. Quick example. Um, I am involved in legislation in New Jersey, which is trying to put something called coercive control into our Prevention of Domestic Violence Act, and it's just sort of like the dynamics of abuse. And um, it was a debate about whether a list of factors should be included of what coercive control looks like versus some like generic language such that we as lawyers always see. And the argument I was making was most of the people in domestic violence restraining orders on either side represent themselves and therefore need the more concrete list. And the Bar Association was opposing me saying, no, 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 we have to give judges flexibility. One of the legislators in this um, hearing that we were at said that she herself was um, a survivor of domestic violence and she didn't realize she was a survivor or that she was in the middle of an abusive situation until she read a list of coercive control factors in a different jurisdiction and realize that she was part of that. And so, man, that was persuasive because she was right there amongst the other legislators who paid a lot of attention to her story. Yep, question. Are you talking about are you talking about in the courtroom or in a written document? So so I'm gonna talk about a written document versus um, a, I mean I'll address both. In a written document, you, the typical way you tell a story is chronological. Like you start with what the world looks like, and then there was an interaction, and here's what the world looks like, and we would like to change that. Right, but in law, we always start with, here's what the world looks like now, and we want it to stay the same, or we want it to be different. And so we immediately set the ending up front and say we want that ending to be changed or stay the same. So right away, we're changing how a story is usually told. And then we may tell a story topically, in which case we use headings to, si to signal that we're like bouncing around with the traditional three act, and that's fine. That's when you use headings. In a trial situation, we very, um, very often are telling stories out of order because we are constrained by what this witness 
can testify to versus what this witness can testify to. And it's why opening and closing arguments are so important to sew the story together in the beginning, but most importantly, at the end. You heard from five different witnesses, and here's the story in total. So does that help answer your question? So, I mean, like, I don't think that in law, telling the story from once upon a time to happily ever after is really the norm. Well, I mean, it's an aesthetic Yeah. It, it always is going to depend on what's best for the client. Always. And how you can reach the goal that the client needs. Other questions? Yeah. Um, well, um, I love Glinda, and I can't stand that they, they untold her story, right? Like, MGM really just destroyed her story and Dorothy, too. So that inspires me of, like, what happens with the un... So, but one of my early works um, was about Harry Potter and all of the other stories I had loved as a child. So, I mean, I react to stories, and... You know, I'm a sci-fi, not as much sci-fi fantasy geek, so yeah, that always influences me, and sure, Barbie influences me too, and so, um, yeah, I'm not just a let's go through, like, the Supreme Court storytelling, I'm, I'm always going to be like, what's out in the world, and truly was Taylor Swift having dinner four miles from my house two weeks ago? I don't know, but I'm terribly excited by that. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, she was um, there with Sophie Turner, and I'm, Anyway, so hasn't TMZ supposedly confirmed it? I'm not so sure. Anyway, did I answer your question? Yes. Yes. My, yes, very often. And also, um, there's an advanced writing textbook by um, a person, a professor at Wyoming, Michael R. Smith, who talks about how you can actually reference that in legal documents, literary allusions, and how that's super persuasive if people have shared knowledge of it. And so why you will sometimes see in stuff you're reading references to whether it's famous works, whether it's Greek mythology, but I've had students who actually have run an analysis of whether SNL people have been um, cited by courts and used. Um, and I, there was also somebody, I mean, there's one who does, a professor who talks about um, domestic violence in um, country music lyrics. And so people use this all the time. So um, there's a, articles out there about Star Trek references and how important they are in law and lawmaking. So there's all kinds of fun stuff. And honestly, as a law student, if you're writing um, law review articles, that's a whole thing that you could be doing that's terribly fun. So other articles. The SNL one was never published. Also never published was one that talked about the Skilla versus um, Charbonnet. Is it Charb? How do you pronounce that? Charbonnet? Um, rock in a hard place and how it could mean two different things. Really interesting stuff that students have worked on. Highly recommend it. I know just the journal to publish it too. <laughs> yeah. I'll be here all day, folks. All right. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to our first panel, which is the focus of how the law influences pop culture. And I will be introducing the moderator of the panel, who will then introduce the panelists. So I'm just going to briefly introduce the first moderator, which is Kelly Muir, who is a visiting professor of law here at the uh, Brandeis School of Law and is teaching lawyering skills. So come on in, Kelly. Yeah, everybody come. On. Hello, everyone. Our panel today is on how the law influences pop culture, and I am happy to introduce the panelists. First, we have Joey Wilkerson from IU South 
Come sit down, Joey. This is Joey. <laughs> is it IU Southwest? Southeast. Southeast. IU Southeast. And he and I will let him. T the, each panelist will discuss more of their own background before they give their um, opening remarks here on the panel today. So our next panelist is Danielle Lewis, and she is from NKU Chase College of Law. So she's from the north. <laughs> And finally, we have Professor Mark Murphy, and he is here from the University of Louisville, Professor of Practice. All right. I had planned to sit down there with, with you folks, but I guess I'm standing up here. I'd rather sit over there. I don't know what Joanne has. I'm not doing that. So first, yeah, I'll do this. Are there? I'll start again. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I had said, ju just to catch you up, Dean Sweeney, I had said uh, fabulous things about you um, in your absence. And thanks, uh, Professor Robbins, for being here. Um, so I was talking about Justice Brandeis, whose remains are right outside, for those of you who are live streaming this. And, you know, he uh, is at ground zero of storytelling, um, at least at the Supreme Court level. And that storytelling is storytelling that was uh, uh, of the utmost importance. And it was because, you know, his concept was, look, we've, we've been briefing these things. We know what the law is. It's pretty cut and dried. And it was a cut and dried practice of law before the United States Supreme Court. And history, his papers are upstairs. And Kurt Metzmeyer will be happy to, to walk you through with proper credentials and security uh, uh, applied. But is to say, these are the societal issues this is the story that I need to tell. And even though he wasn't talking to a jury, he was talking to the Supreme Court and he was talking eventually to his colleagues. These are the, this is the bigger picture. And, and that's another way of saying storytelling is the bigger picture. As for me, briefly, um, kind of without knowing it, um, every event that's happened in my life has brought me to this table here today, uh, Dean Sweeney, because I've been involved in storytelling and the law and the intersection of that um, by happenstance, really, my whole life. Um, as a trial lawyer for 40 years, um, I learned early from some very competent and, 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 and wonderful and kind trial lawyers that syllogism and logic and, and reason have a place in, in a trial. But without a story, it's a very small place, and it's a very unconvincing place. And there has to be a story. If you're a prosecutor, you have to tell a story. If you're in a criminal case, you have to tell a story um, because you're asking people from off the street, quite literally, uh, who haven't been engaged in matters of that level of importance, in the most extreme cases, to decide that a man or a woman should go to prison for the rest of their lives. Well, you can't just say, believe me, this person should go to prison the rest of their life because you're not going to convince anybody of that. 
And so you have to tell the story. And the story begins usually long before, if it's an effective story as a trial lawyer. Uh, and this applies to plaintiff's lawyers and, and, and people in contract disputes and everything else. The story begins a long time before the facts and issues that are actually presented to the jury that day. And the story begins sometimes, in a criminal case, it can be when the person is born. Not because you're going to track them through. Certainly from a defense attorney's point of view, um, you know, there's a saying in the criminal law that uh, a judge doesn't sentence a crime. He sentences a human being. And you have to tell the judge, and this is even in a sentencing hearing, even if there's no jury present, this, this person's story may or may not end today in this courtroom, one way or the other, depending on the sentence that they're being uh, given. Um, even if it's a three-year felony sentence, that could be the end of their life. And in the United States, where you have felony, uh, a felony can deprive a person of a vote and rights and, and a job and perhaps their future, this person's story may be ending today, judge or members of the jury, but it began on May 19th, 1959, or whenever, and that's storytelling. Meanwhile, about 16 years ago, I began to actually tell stories um, in the newspapers. And um, I was the only, I know this because sadly, uh, 20 years ago, there were 300 political artists, political cartoonists in the United States. And um, I'm an officer of the, of the organization that now um, represents the remaining 23 editorial cartoonists in the United States of America. And so I can say, however, so that's the bad news. It's bad for all of us. It's bad for journalism. It's bad for, for truth telling. Um, it's also bad for the law, and I'll get to it in a second, but that uh, I am the only lawyer who was drawing, is drawing political cartoons, the only practicing lawyer drawing political cartoons. And a lot of my cartoons um, are influenced by the law. Our panel is how the law influences pop culture. And to Professor Robin's point, um, when she's talking about, um, and she uses uh, better words than I would use, um, but archetypes and the neuroimaging and the science behind symbols and images. So I can make a point, and some of you have been to my office or been through my office and you've seen um, a cartoon that I drew when Justice um, uh, Jackson was uh, confirmed to the United States Supreme Court. And I wanted to express as an example, first of all, just how happy I am. I mean, drawing political cartoons and storytelling in that way is an ex exercise in hubris and ego. Every morning I wake up and I say, what does the world really need to hear what I think? You know? um, and I'm the kind of person that I think it's very important that they hear that. And so what I wanted to know was how do I express as an example uh, the joy that I felt with her appointment and confirmation, and, but not write that in so many words, because there were other people writing those words, writing them better than I could. And so the story that I tell is a story with pictures using the archetypal images and the image that even the younger among you will probably recognize is the Norman Rockwell painting of Ruby Bridges being escorted into, uh, into her school by federal marshals. And I thought to myself, because the law has influenced pop culture, hold on a second, justice, this, ju this new justice is going to have federal marshals also escorting her. And, and so I was able to draw the parallel that, literally draw the parallel that as an adult woman being escorted into court um, by this time, by the people that are working for her and helping her serve the interests of justice. Um, I'll close my little piece here by saying that um, the storytelling that we tell isn't just for trial lawyers and it's not just for those people in court or for Justice Brandeis. Um, and, and the first year students that I'm honored to be with uh, twice a week at least um, know that I say this as well. You're telling stories if you're corporate counsel. And you're telling stories if you're uh, counseling somebody on, on decedents of states matters. Because the problem is never presented to you in isolation by people who have no other thoughts or background to it. These are humans. And we are humans. As humans, we communicate most effectively by telling stories. And in the, from the perspective of lawyers, it's... I'll say this, another exercise in hubris, it's so much more important that we tell our stories effectively, whether they're publicly, whether they're in a newspaper, or whether they're to a client in an office that you'll have a couple years from now.
So. Thank you, Professor Murphy. Professor Lewis, would you like to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about this? Thank you so much. Um, as Professor Muir said, I'm Danielle Lewis. Um, she said I'm from up north. I actually do live in Louisville, and I was a civil litigator here for about 12 years before I transitioned to teaching um, a couple of years ago. I teach legal writing, which really could be called legal storytelling. Um, I'm also the director of the field placement program, which is essentially the externship program at Chase. And then I also help direct our trial team and our moot court teams, um, which is also storytelling. And so I was really thrilled and excited to um, see that a panel like this was taking place and even better yet to be invited to participate in it. So thank you so much to Dean Sweeney um, and to Professor Robbins for being here and for such a great talk. Um, storytelling, you know, I, I loved Professor Murphy when you said, you know, storytelling sort of brought you here because I promise we didn't compare notes before this, but I really had planned to say the same thing. Um, I wanted to become a lawyer. I decided when I read my first John Grisham book, um, probably middle school, um, and then to a lesser degree, I spent too much time watching Law and Order in high school and thought that, you know, that made the law seem pretty cool. It made lawyers seem pretty cool. And I never considered any other career path. Um, now, we all know that the way that the law is portrayed in pop culture um, is not always 100% accurate. Uh, and that's probably better, right? Because it, it may not be as entertaining. I very quickly learned that actually being a trial lawyer meant a lot more research and writing than talking in court, much to my chagrin. Um, but then I actually discovered I liked research and writing. And so now here I am on the academic side of it. But I love teaching uh, both my moot court, my trial team students, and also my writing students that really, if you want to be persuasive, uh, Certainly, you need to know the law. You need to be able to understand the law and talk intelligently about the law. But the way that you organize your arguments and the way that you tell a story, you tell your client's story, or even as a 1L, the way that you're, when you're trying to brief a case for one of your doctrinal classes, you're trying to understand that story so that you can retell it in class if your professor calls on you that day. Um, having that skill is, is fundamental, and it's so important. Um, we've seen lots of examples in the way that the law influences pop culture. You know, we see uh, movies about famous cases. Um, and sometimes we may find out, well, that, that movie wasn't 100% accurate. Maybe some details were changed to, to make it more entertaining. Um, but, but sometimes, you know, it is very similar. And a lot of times that may be the non-legal public's uh, first introduction to legal concepts, specific legal concepts or an important uh, legal case, um, or the law in general. You know, for a young uh, middle school student, you know, who didn't really even understand what lawyers did and, and read a John Grisham book and thought, lawyers save the world, that's what I want to do. Um, but a great example of this, a recent example for me, uh, is last week I had the privilege of hearing uh, Randy Schoenberg speak. Um, Randy is a, a California lawyer who handled a famous case that went all the way up to the Supreme Court uh, to recover some art that was stolen from a Jewish family during World War II um, and came to be in the possession of the Austrian government. And Randy, as a young lawyer, um, sued the Austrian government, uh, the Republic of Austria, and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, and, and he eventually won for his client. This is his grandmother's best friend. He was able to get these five paintings back for her family. Um, it's a fascinating, beautiful case. And it was made into a movie. Has anyone seen, uh, I think it's 2015, the movie Woman in Gold? Yeah, Ready? I remember that. Oh, good. Okay. One. You should all go watch it. Um, Ryan Reynolds plays Randy Schoenberg. He was very pleased about that. Um, Helen Mirren plays um, the plaintiff in that case, his grandmother's best friend who was suing to get her family's artwork back. Um, and it's a beautiful movie. It's a beautiful story. Um, but, but he'll be the first to tell you, right? There are some differences in the way... Um, that the movie portrayed it, just to make it more digestible and understandable for the general public. Um, but regardless, you know, you might think that he would, he would be upset about that, right? Or, you know, well, they changed some things. Uh, not at all, because that helps tell um, his story, his client's story, uh, to a much broader audience than the people who, um, maybe a lot of us in this room, who might have, you know, gone and read the Supreme Court opinion or followed it in the newspapers, 
you know, that story reached a much broader audience because, you know, it was taken up um, and made part of pop culture, taken out of just the, the purely legal realm. Um, and really, I think that that is the beauty of what pop culture does. Um, it makes law more accessible to the non-legal, non-lawyer public. Um, now more than ever, you know, 30, 40 years ago, when um, the non-legal community might learn about the law in pop culture, it was through more traditional mediums. Uh, print, you know, books, newspapers, radio, TVs, movies. Now, in 2023, there are infinite uh, possibilities and ways that the public um, comes in contact with the law and the law specifically in pop culture, right? You've got social media, all the various forms of it. You've got podcasts, you've got videos, video blogs, um, the internet. And so, you know, I, I think that's um, really the wonderful thing about the way that the law gets portrayed in pop culture is it makes it more accessible. Um, and, and maybe, you know, leads some people to, uh, to come to the law as a vocation. Um, I'll end with this. My uh, recent interest in um, writing and speaking has been about how um, the use of AI in the law, and specifically generative AI, like ChatGPT, um, what are the implications of using AI for practicing lawyers? There are a lot of ethical implications. Um, if any of you are currently taking PR or when you take PR, I'm sure that um, your PR professor will have um, generative AI. There's just a host of uh, lovely problems to talk about from a PR perspective. Um, but I also think on the law school faculty side, you know, we, we're also realizing that um, when you graduate, when you pass the bar, when you start representing clients and practicing law, um, you will be consumers of AI, of generative AI. And so what does that look like? What should that look like? How do we teach you to be good consumers um, and users of generative AI? Um, and certainly I think that as, as pop culture makes that more accessible and more well known to the world as well, that we're gonna see even more of an intersection between those areas. So once again, thank you so much for having me here. Um, and I can't wait to, to talk about it more with, uh, once we get to the questions. Hey. Well, I'm, uh, I'm James Wilkerson, but everybody calls me Joey, so you guys can call me Joey too. I am a proud alum of Brandeis, class of 2018, uh, Professor Sweeney. She was my lawyering skills professor. Uh, in 2020, um, whenever COVID said that I could not go to universities to talk about sexual assault prevention anymore, um, Professor Sweeney said, hey, we have this little blog that we're doing, this little legal journal called I Taught the Law. So why don't you come write about the stuff that you would normally talk about um, until you can get back out there talking. So it's like, well, sure, professor, not doing anything else, might as well. Um, and of course, that led to um, getting several books published um, and finally putting that English degree uh, that I got from L way back when to use. Um, currently, right now, I am the Director of Institutional Equity um, and the Title IX Coordinator at Indiana University Southeast in New Albany. Um, I'm also a professor over there. That's, that's the fun part of the job. Um, so I teach um, a class um, on sex offenders uh, for criminal justice. I always like to tell people like, okay, it's a class on <laughs> sex offenders, not for sex offenders. Cause you know, you kind of get that jumbled up. Uh, so we teach sex offenders um, over at IU Southeast, also gender, cultural and sex, sexuality studies as well. And this spring, I'll be teaching a class on sex offenses here at the law school. So if you are still putting your uh, schedules together, you know, hop in that one. Um, so I love the fact that we're doing this on pop culture. Um, so what kind of brings me to pop culture is, is pettiness. Um, a few years ago, I submitted a conference submission um, to NASPA, which is kind of one of the ruling um, organizations uh, when it comes to higher ed. And I got that rejection letter, and the rejection letter said, there is just too much pop culture in your submission. Now, the submission was how to teach sexual assault prevention to 18 and 19-year-old boys. So to me, like pop culture is the perfect way to do that. 
Um, NASPA, though, they put their value on all of their empirical research and their peer-reviewed articles. And I'm like, guess who doesn't care about any of that? Um, <laughs> The, the, the audience that I'm trying to reach that would be a little bit more likely to perk up um, if we talk about a storyline from South Park versus what was published um, in whatever academic dem dem journal that you got framed and put on your wall. Um, so from that point, it was like, okay, you know what? Let's do whatever we can to show people the value of pop culture and how pop culture can be such a valuable vehicle um, to teach us different things, um, and different things that might be a little bit complex. Um, when it comes to the classes that I, I get to teach, um, you know, I can sit down with my class, and we can go through all of the textbook um, things when it comes to domestic violence. But I can also start that class by talking about Kanye West and Kim Kardashian, and painting a picture for you of their relationship so you can kind of understand what I'm talking about. So you can take what we have in the textbook and see how it applies to real life. Um, I can sit down in my sex offenders class and we can talk about pedophilia. Um, we can talk about uh, the, the, the double standard when it comes to uh, men and women uh, and, and sexual um, offenses when it comes to the perpetrators. But I can also sit down and I can open that conversation up by watching scenes from South Park that can break it down a little bit. And it's like, oh, okay, that's what we're talking about. So seeing the, the value in pop culture is really important. It's, it's just like you said, it's a way that we can, um, it's a vehicle that we can take these complex areas of the law and break it down for people who didn't have the opportunity to come to law school. Um, but to where they can still understand it. So, um, yeah, very excited that we have a conference like this. Of course, the School of Law would have a conference <laughs> like this because we're awesome. Um, so, yeah, very excited to hop into these questions. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's <laughs> All right, well, I'll probably start back down here. But, uh, of course, this question is directed at the entire panel, but we'd like to hear from each of you individually. Does the public have such an intense fascination with the law in this way as to hold to pop culture? Well, I think it's three things. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think one of them is that it's in our genes. I mean, we talked about this the other day in class. I mean, the, the first story that most people remember from from the Bible itself is the is Cain murdering Abel, and um, uh, following up on that, I did some further research. I didn't realize that God put Cain on prote in protective custody. After that, um, he, he there's a three passages about the the different punishments that God could have issued as a result of that. But we our storytelling. From the beginning of time, and this is Western culture, I can't speak for, for other cultures, but has, has been about the law. Um, and I think there's two reasons for that. One of them is that we're a judgy people. I mean, we like to judge. How can you explain the popularity of Judge Judy? Who would want to watch a petty Petty in every de definition of the word, uh, 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 you know, uh, dispute between two people for fifty-eight dollars, or the deposit on a on a on an apartment, or a minor car wreck, or somebody didn't walk the dog at the time they were supposed to, is because we love the idea somehow that somebody's being called on the carpet, and that, and we wait in in breathless anticipation for what Judge Judy is going to do in this case. And there's like nine of those shows now, I think, as I recall. So we like judging. It's in our genes. And the third thing to me is it's voyeurism to a certain extent. Because when there's a case that's publicized, all the way back to O.J. Simpson, I say all the way back. I have to say all the way back because none of the students that are here were born during that period of time. <laughs> so all the way back in time immemorial. Uh, but there was still a written record of the time uh, when O.J. Simpson was prosecuted. <laughs> 
But, but through today, whenever there's a, a true crime on TV, whenever there's a, a something that's being broadcast in that regard, that's the only chance we, we actually see into people's lives. That's when you're allowed for one of the only times in your lives to see what their house looks like. I always have told my family, I said, because, you know, the other people in my family will say, our house is so messy. You know, my wife will say, oh, my God, our house looks like, a, you know, looks like a mess. I said, you have no idea what a murder scene looks like. And I'm not even talking about the blood. Just, you know, there's laundry everywhere. And you, they had the misfortune of killing somebody on the day. They hadn't folded their laundry yet. And, and so everybody gets to see it. But more, more specifically, in, in a more real way, through those cases, I think one of the fascination, points of fascination is that we, we learn about people's lives. Why were they involved with this person? What could have gone wrong in this relationship that would have caused him to kill her, then hide the body, then take it out to sea? And then try to weight it down ineffectively. What's wrong with that? How did that happen? Clean the boat, bring it back, and you don't get that in your own lives. It's, hopefully. yeah, yeah, hopefully. And it's also none of your damn business what's going on in the house four, four streets over. But now we get to see, because somebody's done something awful to somebody else in the criminal context, everything about those people. We get into their cell phones. We get into their uh, what they downloaded, what they're watching on TV. So I think voyeurism, frankly, has a lot to do with it. I, I agree with all three of those reasons, and I um, thought of a couple more. I think that a lot of times when, when someone gets involved, you know, we like to say as lawyers, when people come see us, it, it's usually the worst day of their life, you know. They're coming to see you because something has happened to them or they have a problem. Their family is being broken up. They've gotten injured. They've been fired. Um, and, and so, you know, we're interested in these stories because something, usually bad, um, unfortunately, also maybe because of voyeurism, that's interesting to us, you know, but has happened to this person. And so kind of understanding that story, um, it, it's, it's just natural instinct. And I think it's also relatable, right? So when we read about true life legal cases or watch them in a movie or see them on TV um, or on the internet, you know, these are people that... We sort of see ourselves in, um, you know, I, uh, also a T-Swift fan, but I never really see myself in her, but you know, when I see a story about, uh, a, you know, elder millennial mother, you know, um, that I, I can see myself in that person. Um, and so it's relatable. And I think that that, you know, sort of leads to the fascination as well about these true life stories. We want to not only see how it turns out, but we want to understand why, you know, why did this happen? Um, you know, could I see this happening to me? If so, could I avoid it, right? We like to think that we can control things. So, you know, I, I'm always um, sort of, you know, saddened when you see a story about a domestic violence victim. And you see, the, first of all, I never read the comments, and I forget this rule, and I do it, and you see people like, well, why didn't she just leave? And, you know, and just, because we want to think, right, that that would never happen to us, that if we make the right choices, that we could prevent that. Um, it, it's that wanting that sense of control, right, to think that, that this wouldn't happen to us, but yet we're still fascinated by it because we see ourselves in that person. Um, I think as human beings, we just want to be entertained. It, being entertained is something that we strive for. It's, um, it's why we read the fiction. It's why we spend hours on TikTok. It's why I just listen with bated breath as my daughter tells me about the drama on her nine-year-old playground. <laughs> we want to be, be entertained. And if, this, if the story is good enough, then the law can be downright entertaining. Um, you have a story of, of, a, of a woman who um, is, 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 kind of, is kind of homely, but, but still very, very nice and sweet. And she's married to this really overbearing guy. Um, this guy who's, who's, who's very violent, um, who's verbally violent, who's physically violent, and who just takes total advantage uh, and, and control of this woman. And so one night, she gets tired of it all. She goes in the kitchen, she gets a butcher knife, and she cuts his penis off. Here we go. And, <laughs> and, and the story, then it goes to court, and half of, half of the country, men, 
are like, oh my gosh, how could that happen? She is such an evil witch. And then the other half is like, but no, us women, we have been, we're tired of it. We're sick of it. Yeah, slice another one. <laughs> and, and this could be, this could be a storyline in any Netflix show that there is. But this is real life. This is real life. This is Lorena Bobbitt and John Bobbitt. And this is stuff that, I mean, at least I grew up watching on the news. And I tell you, there's nothing more entertaining than, she did what? So now I'm drawn in to this story about domestic abuse. I'm drawn into this story and I'm learning about marital rape and marital rape laws in this country and how they've evolved but how we need to take them further. All because of this very sensationalized story that popped up on the news. You brought up O.J. Simpson earlier on. You have this beautiful neighborhood, rich neighborhood, nothing ever happens here, nothing ever happens. And all of a sudden, you have two dead bodies. You have one beautiful model-esque blonde that is found dead, almost decapitated. You have a, an, an attractive man who is stabbed to death. And the, the main suspect is a celebrity. Uh, he's a former football all-star. He's an actor. And at least at that time, he was a pillar of the black community. And he is the suspect in this thing. And once again, it's like, who done it? This could be a storyline for any Netflix series, but this is real life. And now you can turn your television on and you can watch a murder trial in the middle of the day, which is far more entertaining than any soap opera that's on at the time. So, yeah, the law has the ability to be downright entertaining if the story's good enough. Yeah, I think that I would like to direct this next one to you first, and then we'll come back down. But how accurately has pop culture portrayed the law then, and what impact has that portrayal had on pop culture at large? Like how accurately does does it happen? So pop so pop culture and the law the, the the some of the problems that you see whenever it comes to the portrayal is that we have to take these complex things and we have to kind of smooch them down into digestible bites. Because if we don't, people get bored. You guys are law students. You know how boring some of this stuff can be, right? People, people, can, people can get bored. A Law and Order episode is one hour long, 45 minutes with commercials. So now I gotta shove an entire investigation and a court case into 45 minutes. I gotta hit the high points. And I think maybe some of the problem you see whenever you, 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 you make it that simple is that maybe sometimes people think it really is that simple. And we all know that it's not. Well, why don't they just do this? That's what they did in the show. I'm like, yeah, you missed like 14 of hours that we had to cut out in order to keep you invested in this thing. So it helps because, you know, it, it's simplifying things. It's making it it digestible, it's opening the door for people that don't have a law background to kind of get involved in it. But I think we do have to understand that there is just more than what you're seeing or hearing in this hour long podcast. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think that the beauty of all the different mediums we have available to us now is that we do have the ability to get a more accurate uh, portrayal or sense of what has happened in a given case, but you probably have to go to more than one source. Um, because I absolutely agree with Joey that if you're watching a 45-minute episode, um, you, you are just getting the high points. Even if you're watching a two-hour movie, if it's about a court case that spans several years, you're getting the high points. But if that's enough to pique your interest, then you can go find a book or some articles, um, things written by the, the people actually involved. Um, you know, podcasts now where people are looking at you know, maybe this is a case that, that everybody knew about, Lorena Bobbitt, for example, but now we're going to have a podcast devoted specifically to talking about uh, the Bobbitt's marriage leading up to, you know, the assault. Um, and so I think that you can get a more accurate portrayal. We have more availability uh, to infer, more access to information than we've ever had, um, but it's a matter of, of going to different sources. Yeah, and this isn't a counterpoint to what you said. But one of the things that I see in new trial lawyers 
is everybody knows, for instance, in terms of telling stories in a trial setting, uh, that one of the first things you say to a jury, you probably should say, is everybody's been watching TV and everybody loves, uh, you know, the, the shows and CSI and everything else, and this isn't going to be anything like that. It is, mm -hmm. you know, we've been through seven years of discovery and you're going to see a doctor's deposition that itself is going to take three days and all this other stuff. And so th that's good. They, they advise the jury that it isn't like you see in pop culture. But then what I see in the younger lawyers often is they don't realize the lessons, on the other hand, this is more for panel two, is how pop culture influences the law, but the lessons that they can learn from, from TV and the lessons that they can learn from pop culture, and that is that, getting back to one of the first points I made, your, your, your closing argument, for instance, can't just be a recitation of the rational reasons why this client is innocent or guilty. It should be like something that Joe Pesci would say. It can be and should be the argument that Tom Hanks, I mean, that, that Tom Cruise would make. They, not only just because they expect that, and, and you can't, you have to be yourself, but it is theater. And there are times when the presentation that you're making as a lawyer, and there's a lot of different kind of law you can go into, but if you end up in a type of a practice, practice of law where there are presentations and there are examinations and there are arguments, then like it or not, it, it, there's a theatrical part of that. And short of having classical theater training or being part of a, 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 a local theater group, you can get those lessons from TV. So I, I hate it when people shy away from that. The other thing though too is that um, I think that people are interested in this because we realize we need the law. You know, I was kidding a little bit before about being judgy and liking to be judging people, but I think our sense of self and the stories we want to tell ourselves are that we live in a society that's governed by law. And I think that there's a fear, an almost existential dread right now in the United States perhaps, uh, or as an example, that the law that we've known and grown up with, at least from a constitutional perspective or a government perspective, um, it is being diminished somehow, is being, is being swept away. And those stories need to continue to be told as well. I had a recent uh, moderator's privilege to tell a small story. I had a, my 1Ls just completed their first closed memo. Some of them are here, yay. And um, the problem was a kidnapping problem. And so I thought I'd find some popular culture, a show, something I could pull out to show students how this may play out. And the only show I could find was so realistic it was somewhat boring. And I thought, well, if that isn't an accurate portrayal of how this would go, they found something, you know, in evidence that was refuted perfectly and the charges were dropped and that was the end. And I was like, well, I can't even show this to them because it's too accurate. But sometimes it is a little fun to have that heavy hand do it. So that being said, how, how do, when, when we're thinking about this, we're thinking about how and why we're fascinated with it, but, but how has the law changed popular culture in America? Whether it's specifically how we portray the world in popular culture, how does the law do that? And I'll direct the first few questions. Okay, well, I think, um, I think that it, it's really created sort of sub-genres. You know, for example, true crime podcasts. Um, you, know, you, you know, maybe whereas before people would, nobody would want to admit they were interested in, you know, every time you saw a newspaper article or a news story on the TV about murder, you turned it up, right? Like, you didn't want to be that weirdo. Now it's cool, you know? There's a whole group of, like, yeah, we're true crime podcast junkies, you know, if anybody listens to um, my favorite murder, you know, murderinos. Um, I, I think it has, I think it has normalized, you know, sort of our fascination with legal stories and cases. Um, not that every murder leads to a legal case, but most of them do, hopefully. Um, and, you know, so I think it has, it, it has also created sort of its own genre um, in pop culture. And, 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 you know, maybe I'm projecting my own personal experience, but I, I do think it has brought some people to the field of law, right? We, we read stories or we see stories that inspire us or stir a sense of justice in us, um, you know, make us want to do something to change the world. And, we see an example of, you know, one way to do that is to become a lawyer, right? And then to wield a certain amount of power um, in that capacity. And so I think it, you know,
know, that intersection, I think, between law and pop culture has always been there. Um, I think now, just, you know, with all the different mediums we have, it's just more pronounced. Or maybe more, more obvious. Um, you know, with that, with that subgenre, too, that has created more room for conversation among people. Um, one of the big problems, I, I, I know my wife is tired of me. Um, <laughs> one of the big problems that I had whenever I was in law school is I, I would go out with other law students, and I would go out with my wife, who is not in law school. And we'd be sitting at dinner, you know, just talking about some of the craziest stuff, like, then, yeah, he cut his head off, and like that was the evidence. And like my wife was like, "Hey, so I know this is interesting to you guys, but you guys are being really loud, and people are looking at our table. So like, you know, bring down, you know, all the talk about you know children getting murdered, and it's like, oh yeah, I guess you're probably right. Um, but one of the things that I kind of see from pop culture and those subgenres." are now we are able to have conversations with each other about different things. Um, TV used to, there used to be shows that were, that was called water cooler television. Um, you know, Seinfeld was so good the night before, let's get together the next day around the water cooler at work and talk about it. Um, same energy, only now we're talking about what we heard on that last podcast that we all listened to. Um, we're talking about what we saw in the last Chris Hansen, you know, episode. Um, we're, we're really getting together and we're able to, to kind of discuss these things. Once again, it's creating, you know, more access for people who may not have been, you know, had access to our world before, um, which is fantastic. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the, that, that's an amazing way that law is kind of, it is creating pop culture almost. Law is like the best reality television <laughs> that you could ever hope for. Um, it, it's it's easy to produce, and you don't have to do much about it, with it. You just got to talk about what happened. I mean, the lawyers have already done all the hard work. All you have to do is sit there and talk about it. So it's like, yeah, this is the easiest reality television or radio or media that there is. I think that we can remember also that it's not just us that is that are observing pop culture, but it's or that are or that are knowledgeable about the law and and maybe trying to reflect that some way in pop culture. I mean, the Hollywood writers, people who write books and scripts, are following the law, too. They may not be following what the most recent state legislature did, except in the case, for instance, of the abortion law. It doesn't always have to be uh, poppy, I guess, or, or a criminal case. But, you know, in the run-up to Dobbs, somebody decided to produce the series The Handmaid's Tale. And, you know... Margaret Atwood wrote that book how many years ago? Decades ago. And what, were it not, I think it's fair to say that were it not for the number of state legislators, legislatures that were effectively uh, outlawing women's choice in, the period, in that period of time, that no one would have green-lighted a, 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 a wonderful, tragic, and, and, and ter you know, terrible terrifying production of The Handmaid's Tale um, to follow up on that. And then The Handmaid's Tale finishes, closes, and then nine months later, Dobbs is issued. So, you know, that, that was a synergistic kind of thing. And uh, hopefully there are the people, and I'll finish with this, not everybody is reading the law review articles written by academics about women's choice. Not everybody is even following that on TV or in the or in or in popular journals, but millions of people watch The Handmaid's Tale, and that probably prompted discussions in those households and around the nation of, is, is that happening? Usually the husbands probably, is that really going to happen? And, and the women were like Kelly right now, like Professor Muir saying, oh yeah, it's coming, and those are the kind of things that um, are helpful about the intersection between law and pop culture. Thank you all so much for that. I, I'd love to hear some questions. First, let's have a round. <laughs> I love this. Someone. OK, I see, I see Jason. Well, 
Well, well from, a, from a criminal yeah. uh, uh, counsel's point of view, the answer is absolutely not. And I've seen the, uh, realistically speaking, I've, and, but it's not that the judges and courts aren't trying, but the, um, the instructions used to be, here's how old I am, don't read a newspaper tonight. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty easy because only a third of the jurors read a newspaper anyway. Um, even if they were going home, and they could walk in and say, honey, remember, don't give me the newspaper tonight with my slippers and pipe, you know, when I walk in the door. Fast forward now, and the, juror, and, and the judges are saying exactly what you just said. We know you're on your phones. We know you're on your phones all day when you're not in here. As a matter of fact, when you leave here, because you haven't been on your phone while you've been in trial, you're going to be on your phone a lot the rest of the night, catching up on your day's feed, uh, your texts with your kids, and everything else. And the best they can say is when you see, when you get a push alert about this case, when you see reporting about this case, you're on your honor to not read it. And I, that's just a nightmare from a trial lawyer's perspective. But I, you may have other thoughts about that. No, yeah, good luck. Yeah, <laughs> good luck with that. And I mean, the, the more sensational the case, the harder it's going to be. I mean, because we, I, we are so trained right now whenever that phone goes off, we are so trained to just pick it up and just look at it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're depending on what that case is and depending on what that headline is, it's hard not to hit that button and, and take a look at it. So yeah. it is the Good rare luck. case that's going to jump the bridge to pop culture. I mean, you know, you, you can have a hundred cases in your career and maybe have one of them that is ever even going to be reported broadly on the Internet. So... That can be frustrating as an attorney, too, yeah. when somebody's, like, talking about this new case and this, this interesting thing that's happened and something that you've seen, like, 20 times on it. You know, you see this pattern. That's the thing that's distracting. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe, not as, maybe not as sensational as Johnny Depp and Amber Heard or something like that, but you've seen it before, and you're like, why didn't this pick up that steam that these others picked up? So, mm -hmm. yeah, that really is. Do you all want to talk about that? The only thing I was going to add is to say that, yeah, in high-profile cases, you might have the option to sequester the jury, um, but that's not going to happen in 99.999% of the cases. And so, um, just as Margaret explained, it's basically on our system, right? Like, please don't look at your phone, or please don't let it influence you. Um, it also, it, it's also harder now because we are in daily contact with so many more people, right? So, if, the, if you spent all day in court, you weren't seeing your coworkers. You might come home and you would see the people that live in your household, but that was probably it. Um, but now, you know, we're texting and we're interacting, we're messaging people on our phones. Um, it, it's so much harder, and I don't know what the answer is, um, it's so much harder to actually, you know, expect that people aren't going to get that information, um, which, which makes, you know, the lawyer's job be that much harder to control the narrative. We like to think of judges as these very neutral, impartial, totally objective, all-knowing decision makers. Um, but judges are human. They're, they're human like you and I. Um, they have biases, 
you know, both conscious and subconscious. Um, and so I think, you know, being aware of that and, and how judges as humans are going to be influenced by pop culture, um, they're going to bring their own experiences to the table and sort of, you know, trying to know that audience is so important. It's often very hard um, as a lawyer. Um, and, and I think that pop culture has maybe only exacerbated that. Um, the other thing I was thinking of when you were talking, you know, about how, you know, you're getting questions from everybody, everyone has an opinion when there's these very well-known cases, um, it, when there's a big Supreme Court decision that comes down, or I remember this with Dobbs, I saw somebody, I saw a meme floating around social media that said, you know, here come all the constitutional law scholars on Facebook, because, because we're, the non, non-lawyers are more exposed to the law through pop culture, um, it also, I think, makes people more likely to comment and have opinions and engage. Um, some, sometimes those opinions are, some, some are better supported than others. Um, but, you know, it, it definitely, I think, increases the number of participants in the conversation, which on the whole, I think, is a good thing, um, even if it maybe makes it a little messier in the interim. That sort of addressed your question and went a little far afield, but I, I, I for one, love the intersection of pop culture and law, and I don't run from it, and I'm not afraid of it, even in, in, in examples like you say. Because to me, in the bigger picture, most of our pop culture heroes and most of our non-legal storytelling has a good guy, a good woman. There's a hero, and the hero is the hero because they're doing something good. And justice is served. That's the, how we want our stories to end. I mean, some of them don't. But the vast majority of the storytelling that we, that we have, you know, you use the, the, um, the different examples of the heroes in, in those stories. They, they end well, usually, unless it's Cormac McCarthy and it's the road and he's awful. And, and, but besides that, and so I like that because I want my stories for my clients to end with justice. And I want it to be good. And I want them to be the hero, ultimately, one way or the other. And I want the jury to act heroically. And I want the contract lawyer to act heroically. And I want the, you know, the judge to act heroically. So I, you know, there, but there are lawyers that would disagree and say, oh my God, it's just a mess. It, it screws up everything because people have these, pre, these predispositions and these assumptions that are just wrong and they're gonna be disappointed because there's never been a great hit TV show yet about seven years of discovery, <laughs> right? And, and I don't plan on writing that script. But the ones that we do see and that we do know, I think are, they're not all uplifting stories, but go ahead. Oh, yeah, so, well, I didn't watch it. <laughs> but, but, it but, but it had such an interesting uh, premise to the oh, story, and it was the murder of this young girl and this boy, this teenage boy being sent away, um, potentially, you know, wrongfully convicted. Um, but yeah, you're right. Seven years of discovery in a civil case, we've yet to see that, and that will probably <laughs> not be entertaining. Okay, that explains a lot. And, that, and by I the didn't way, get, I saw, I was like, they don't get it. They didn't know what he just said. And so, I was like, I got it. And it, I don't know if anybody else thinks Okay, it. two things. It was a great point. And secondly, <laughs> do not read that book. <laughs> so, well, Professor Dunn. I had a comment along those lines. Um, you read that book, right? I have read it. It's amazing. But, but how hard is it to teach from pop culture now? Because pop culture. Shit, Joe.
keep them alive, Joe. But it's also difficult to keep up in a way that everybody can relate to. Not because everybody goes through a different phenomenon or different things and it's just hard. So how do you all stay? I would like to hear what Joey has to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, and let's make sure we get her question here in a second, too. But for me, I think the difficulty is staying current. And, and that's my difficulty. I'm with you. Um, whenever I bring up the Sopranos, my class looks at me like, what are you talking about? And my, my, my heart just shatters because I'm like, what's the Sopranos, the best freaking TV ever? Um, so, yeah, it's difficult, I think, more for me to keep up, to try to keep up with some of the things that, you know, my students could teach me about. Once again, I know Taylor Swift as far as my nine-year-old daughter will let me know Taylor Swift by what we listen to, um, you know, on, on the ride to school. Um, I think what I try to do in my class, the strategies that I try to take is um, try to focus on maybe some of the bigger things that are going on right now. Um, some of the bigger pop culture things that are happening right now to where I don't have to go back and say, do you guys remember five years ago? Because they don't. Oh, um, like, hey, so this story that is unfolding right now, let me kind of explain to you kind of what that looks like. Now, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't, depending on what's happening, but trying to hit the, 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 the newest thing usually is, is, is the path that, um, that works for me. But that means I got to stay up on top of it too, right? Like I got to, <laughs> I got to, you know, take a look at some media that maybe I wouldn't normally look at, um, but thus in being a professor. <laughs> I think there was a question. Yeah, Grace. advantage when you've got an influencer who already has a broad following and they decide to talk about um, some sort of legal issue or a case is they've already got that sort of established audience, um, captive audience, if you will. And so I think that's huge. I mean, yes, when a show comes out on Netflix, Netflix is a very popular streaming platform. Lots of us have access to it, but that doesn't mean that we would necessarily choose to watch that show. But I think the power that influencers have is because when we follow influencers, we start to feel like we know them, you know, particularly the ones who are doing videos and talking to us and engaging, you know, some of them are really good at engaging, doing these live streams and answering questions. And, um, and so it almost feels like you're hearing this from your, your neighbor or your friend. Um, and I think it makes us more interested and more invested in the story. Whereas if it was just a headline that popped up on my news feed, maybe I wouldn't have clicked on it. But because this person that I already know is talking about it, you know, suddenly that makes me interested. So I, I think there's a lot of power there. Sometimes that power can be used for, for bad. Agreed. Um, we spent more time than I wanted to in criminal procedure for the second and third year students correcting what Jay-Z sang in <laughs> 99 Problems. <laughs> you're, you're already shaking your head. He says, I, well, my glove compartment is locked, so is the trunk in the back, and I know my rights, so you're going to need a warrant for that. Not true. <laughs> it, it, and, and so we dissected 99 problems, and, but it wasn't because it's fabulous, but also because it was bad legal advice. But, there, but there's a gen he wasn't giving legal advice, but people took it. And there's, there's a generation of people that grew up thinking 
that the vehicle exception to the Fourth Amendment for exigent circumstances didn't apply. And, and it doesn't. I mean, you can take the search everything. So it, it can go both ways when somebody is that powerful. I was shocked to find out that he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> when I got here, I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I think that is an excellent question. And, and honestly, you know, my truthful answer is I don't know, or as I tell my law students, the answer to every question that you ask me is it depends. Um, you know, for some people, I think it's it, depending on your level of interest and sort of um, the, the reason for your interest and how much attention and time and space you devote to it. Um, it can be fine or it can absolutely delve into the unhealthy realm. That's my initial thought. As as a kid, um, every Saturday night, we at 8 o'clock, you would turn it on Fox 41, and you would watch one hour of Cops. And then at 9 o'clock, you would watch America's Most Wanted. And then you would be scared to death going to sleep because, like, America's Most Wanted, like, no, they're still out there. They could be out, <laughs> out your window right now. So if growing up on that, now today, if you knock on my front door or ring the doorbell and I'm not expecting you, I'm not answering the door. I'm not even looking out the window. Um, and my wife is the exact same way. She's like, uh oh, someone's at the door. I'm like, I've got the lights on real quick. Um, so yeah, I think there's something to, to that paranoia. Um, I think it depends on who you are as to how it affects me. To me, I would tell you that's just how I haven't gotten murdered since I was eight. Um, but yeah, no, there's something, there, there's something to that, 100%. That's how I haven't gotten murdered. Not answering the door for you, UPS. And I've met his wife, and she's exactly like that. She's like the female version. We all know you. <laughs> okay, did we say, I saw Professor Smith. Well, there's a reason why there used to be 320 editorial cartoonists in the United States and now there's only 23. And it hasn't been because there has been a law outlawing free speech in the form of political art. But the corporations who have purchased the newspaper companies and have closed all of the small town newspapers, essentially, and have fired all the political cartoonists at McClatchy and Gannett, have, have not violated the First Amendment. They're making business decisions, but those decisions are protected. Those are lawful decisions. Um, and so the freedom of speech, if the only place that you can speak is in the privacy of your home or to your friends, you know, I mean, the modern platform, the modern public square has been Twitter. That's where people went to argue and exchange ideas. And, and there's hate language, and there was wonderful language, and there was good news and bad news. But it was relatively, before Mr. Musk bought it, it was a relatively, um, I don't want to say neutral space, but uh, there were always issues with it. But it was a place where you could have that discussion. But that is being controlled now and limited and worn down. and. I think what this is back, this is the opposite of what you said, but I think culture could influence the law. I can see where, and there are groups in Congress right now that want to uh, uh, expand the ability to sue editorialists, right? And, and to reduce the def definition of a public figure. 
or a public artist. And, and that, could be, that could be a death knell of sorts because democracy dies in darkness. Did anyone else want to respond to that or we can take one more? If, if there's another question, that's fine. I'll have your answer in a second. Uh, Jake. Jake in the back. Jake in the back. Yeah. Right, that they're not as common. Um, you know, so for example, the, the case I talked about, the movie Woman in Gold, that was a civil lawsuit to recover art um, stolen by the Nazis during World War II. Um, and, and it was a beautiful, compelling story, and so it got turned, and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court, so it got turned into a movie. Um, you don't see as much of that for civil cases, and, you know, as a former civil litigator, I have no problem saying it's probably because our cases are usually more boring. Um, but yeah, that's I, there may be another reason. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Oh yes, yes. Okay, that's true. Or you know, the, and there are shows like Suits. You know, they, they were all doing. Oh please, I spent. There's four. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Did I touch on a nerve here? <laughs> there's 40 people in this room that I've been telling not to watch Suits. I'm sorry. Oh. I know. No, I haven't. I, in fact, they changed me. My students the same. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not endorsing suits, but I'm saying that's civil. Um, oh, what was it? Uh, the Good Wife? Yeah. That, that was civil, you know, but, but again, those are usually, those are high profile, big important clients, lots of money involved, very well dressed lawyers. Well, we could all say Ally McBeal, but there's only seven of us. Well, yes. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Yeah. That's yeah. And I mean, I think at... I think when, when you realize and you remember that, like, pop culture, part of pop culture is trying to sell advertisements, um, part of pop culture is commercial, and part of pop culture is making money, um, that might be why it's a little bit more heavy on the criminal side, because that's the, that's the juicy stuff. Now, for me, yeah, give me some civil cases, but I'm, I'm a law nerd. That's, that, 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 that appeals to me. I don't know if there's enough of me to, you know, for Ford to advertise during mm -hmm. a specific show, which stinks because some of those civil cases are pretty entertaining, mm -hmm. um, and if told the right way, you know, could be successful. But we we have advertisements to sell, right? Exactly. If there's, I think that. Um, Such a good movie.
Okay, everybody, let's get started. We're already five minutes behind, which is keeping us further and further away from the reception that's coming up after this panel. Um, so this is our second panel, and um, as we talked about earlier, panel one was how the law influences pop culture, and this panel is more about how pop, how pop culture influences the law. Now, as you heard in the first panel, this is not an easy separation to make, so I fully anticipate that there will be discussions of both on both panels. Um, so um, I'm hope, I hope everyone got a nice little break and got some refreshments. And I'm going to now introduce our moderator of our sec second panel, which is Mark Martinez. Um, Dr. Martinez ha is our Assistant Director of Diversity and Community Engagement at the uh, University of Louisville, Louis D. Brandeis School of Law, and is a PhD in communication. So that's why I thought he would be perfect to start talking about this other form of communication between these two groups. So I'll let Mark. How are we doing today? Thank you, I don't have to repeat that. Um, well, uh, all right, we ready to hear some more storytellers tell their stories? So we are very, I mean, we're grateful for this panel and grateful this, for this conference. Um, we're grateful to have uh, Professor Marcy uh, Ziegler, who is an assistant professor of legal writing at Northern Kentucky University and also the director of the legal writing program. So please. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Professor Lenita Baker who teaches evidence and civil rights law here at Brandeis. And then uh, we round off the panel with uh, doc Dr. Susan Tanner, who teaches lawyering skills. Is there another? Is lawyering skills here at Brandeis. So I'd like to set the stage a little bit with a, a, a very brief story, or um, I guess I could follow another mark here and uh, engage in some hubris. It's, it's not my story, so it's not that arrogant, but uh, the political philosopher Hannah Arendt, who wrote about uh, political violence, government, uh, and fascism, she said, no civilization would ever have been possible without a framework of stability to provide the wherein for the flux of change. Foremost among the stabilizing factors, more enduring than customs, manners, and traditions, are the legal systems that regulate our life in the world and our daily affairs with each other. And so I want to sort of juxtapose this uh, to a, a very short story. In 2019, an Italian performance artist was embroiled in a civil case in a court right, in a courtroom. What he had done is he was in uh, an art gallery uh, in Italy, and he duct taped a banana to the wall, and he called it comedy, or comedian. Uh, then another Italian artist said, hey, I've duct taped fruit in my work before that, so that's, I'm gonna sue you. I bring this up just to, to say that the judge referenced um, a famous media scholar, Marshall McLuhan, who said that um, art is anything that you can get away with. Uh, to me, this seems uh, germane to the idea of pop culture influencing the law, because there is a, a very long historical narrative or story of pop culture being dangerous. Pop culture is for the masses. Pop culture is for the uneducated. Pop culture is for those who do not have good taste. And so I just kind of wanted to think about that, the idea that if law and the legal field and the, the image of the courtroom represents stability and that which gives us a sense of certainty and justice, what does it mean that pop culture as an agent of chaos is influencing that stabilizing factor? And so with that, um, doesn't matter to me how we go, but Lenita, you're or Professor Baker, you're... So I think we're on the had pop culture influences the law. And 
it's hard to distinguish how the law influences pop culture or pop culture influences the law, but one thing we know is that pop culture influences society. And so as a lawyer, uh, one thing before I became a professor here at this great university, I uh, was a practicing lawyer. In 2020, I had the distinct honor and privilege to represent the family of Breonna Taylor, and I still get work with their family today. Uh, the, Breonna Taylor was murdered. This is to give you an example. I'm, t I'm telling you this as how pop culture influences the law. Breonna Taylor was murdered on March 13th of 2020. I found out about Breonna Taylor. Breonna Taylor was murdered on March 13th, 2020. How the executory world was dissolved. The world was shut down. I'm watching the news, and I hear, I don't know Breonna's name, but I hear a news story that says, Police officer shot, one suspect dead, one suspect in custody. So that was what came on the news March 13th, which is Friday the 13th, and through the next couple of days over the weekend. You don't hear Breonna Taylor's name until a couple more days when suspect is identified. I had already met with her mother, her family, knew I would take the case. We were doing our investigation. I kind of liked that the media wasn't too involved those first couple of months because we were able to investigate without that investigation being tarnished by what was being played in the media. Um, witness statements weren't tarnished by pop culture. No one knew about it. The only thing people talked about the first couple of months was, pop, uh, was COVID. Then you get to May and you start to hear something about Ahmaud Arbery through social media. But it was only after George Floyd was murdered Memorial Day weekend that you really started to, started to hear about Breonna Taylor's case, and it was because of pop culture. This is one of the first PSAs. So, while we get tech support to so that you guys can hear this now, prior to this PSA that you're going to hear, here's the speech, uh, the adoration that is speech for the family of Breonna Taylor. But this video was referenced by the Supreme Court Christian, and it is huge. It's hard to read. Do you know what happened to Brianna? What happened to Brianna Taylor? What's it still in the house? Inside the house. Inside the house. Taylor. Do you know what happened to Brianna Taylor? I am Tamika Palmer. I am the mother of Brianna Taylor. Three officers on the Louisville Metro Police Department used a battering ram to knock down her door. They fired 22 times. Eight of those bullets landed in the body of the most essential worker I will ever know. Bree was murdered by the Louisville Metro Police Department. And after they killed her, they asked me if she had any enemies. No, absolutely not. This story started coming out differently and people started learning the truth of what was happening and the things that went wrong that night. Now the whole city is mad. Now the whole world is mad. Brianna should not be dead. Some days I feel like I can't breathe without her. This should never happen to another family. I am Brianna Taylor's mother, say her name. Now that we know what happened to Brianna Taylor, it is time for us to act 
and to get justice for her and her family. There are a few things that you can do no matter where you are in this country. The first thing is call Louisville Mayor Greg Fisher and demand that he fired the officers responsible for murdering Breonna Taylor. Number two, call the Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron and demand that he charge the officers who are responsible for murdering Breonna Taylor. Next, call the interim police chief Robert Schrouder and tell him to finish his investigation and immediately turn over the details to Breonna's lawyers and also to the attorney general. And now Louisville residents, the power is in your hands. Breonna Taylor's family has said that they are not just fighting for her, but they're fighting to ensure that what happened to Brianna never happens again. There's a vote in your town this week. Call your council members and let them know that you demand that they vote to ban no-knock warrants. Do you know what happened to Breonna Taylor? Do you know what happened to Breonna Taylor? I was a famous person for a little bit. Uh, but you saw all of this to say, we use pop culture. That story was our story. It was a story that we used to go on and say, let's just be up, upset about this uh, shooting that happened. We wanted the world to know the true story of Breonna Taylor. And we had all of these women, we actually met on a Zoom call, I'll just break that down. We met on a Zoom call on Breonna's birthday. I was flabbergasted at the number of women that showed up. I was like, okay. But one question that was asked So the one thing, the dangerous thing about pop culture is if they don't have the story right, they can make it a horror because they are telling a story to get people's attention. So we worked with you, the, we worked with the celebrities to get them to the story. We heard, we didn't even let them tell the story. But if you recognize the voice, I know Mark probably recognized the voice of the storyteller, but Sadiq Rivera uh, of the Louisville Urban League, she is a former president of Louisville Urban League. We let her tell the story. Uh, but we put all of their, all of them started at the beginning. Do you know what happened to Breonna Taylor? And then at the end, we had the national basketball. The Sixers at practice in the bubble as the NBA inches closer to its restart next week. Players are devising plans to deliver social justice messages. Tobias Harris is thinking about much more than slogans on T-shirts. We want to make sure that Daniel Cameron will arrest the cops and officers involved with Breonna Taylor's death. And um, yeah, that's all I got to say. Thanks, T. Um, that's going to gonna be, my that's gonna be my answer for every question. Fair enough. For Daniel Cameron to step up and to do what's right. And that's the only message I got today. I appreciate everybody. Thanks. And he wasn't the only player. LeBron James did it. Every Nashville basketball player, um, when they were interviewed, had decided that the, on, the, on those first couple of days when they returned from the bubble, that in any interview that the answer was going to be with some form of Breonna Taylor demanding Daniel Cameron um, charge the officers. So you heard the, the consistency in the demands that were being made, too. The Sixers at practice. You had the WNBA, who dedicated their entire season jerseys, little t-shirts, you know, um, and, and all of this is pop culture, right? But it's, we had them telling the story, mayor, fire the officer, Daniel Cameron, charge the officer, Metro Council, ban no knock warrants. We got two out of the three. <laughs> um, and then I'm not going to play the song because it it's a little bit longer, but Alicia Keys continued through. She made a song, and if we have time at the end, we can play the song so you can hear, but she's talking about different um, social justice cases and not getting justice for them and continuing to fight for justice. But I say all of that to say, we used pop culture to get the message that we needed for change. And I pulled this quote from Deanne Aguirre, who's a star, uh, she sits on 
boards of every major corporation almost, it seems like. But she's a, a she's definitely a strategic, a corporate strategist. She says, powerful and sustained change requires constant communication, not only throughout the rollout, but after major elements of the plan are in place. The more kinds of communication employed, the more effective they are. So while we're in the courtroom, we know politics. I'd much rather not have politics right here. But when we talked about it during the last panel, everyone wants to know about what's going on in America in the courtroom with crime. And so if your story is going to be out there anyway, and lawyers, it's important that you control the message, that you communicate it, uh, and not just at the beginning, but you got to be at the beginning, the middle, next middle, the next middle, the next middle, the end. But when you're fighting for change, we did. We, we were able to get legislative change, right? Uh, both at the city and the state level. Um, you don't just stop because you don't get the indictment that you want. You didn't get the indictment the first time around, but then you got a federal indictment. So you have to continue to communicate the change, the demands, what you want as an attorney. And it's better that you control it. And then, the law's always been pop. I put all the movies up there. One is coming out. I was, I was privileged enough to see The Burial uh, at, this, at a conference I was at this past summer. We had a private screening. It focuses on a civil attorney, Willie Gary, one of the greatest in the business. He's got he's the largest individual uh, jury verdict, a $23 billion verdict. I don't know whether it was paid out or not, but to get a jury to give you $23 billion, people learn it a lot. But the burial comes out uh, October 13th on Amazon Prime. But civil action, Aaron Brockovich, Chadwick Marshall, Just Mercy, the burial. The, problem, the, the thing is, typically when we talk about the law being pop, it's after. We use pop, we use pop culture to lead through the story, and that's something that's much more terrifying as attorneys. But I think as we have so much access, 24-hour news, social media, you have to figure out how to use it when you can communicate it. Thank you very much. So I think I'm going to dovetail a little bit on your um, discussion because that's part of my research. Um, some of the more recent changes to the law based on some um, TV shows and documentaries that have been out and also some of the reactions to um, portrayals in both pop culture and the media about things like um, George, Blo uh, George Floyd and um, Breonna Taylor. Um, but first I want everyone to, you can either close your eyes or you don't have to, but I want you to picture a police interrogation. So you're probably imagining a cold, gray steel table, right? A concrete room with, um, you know, one two-way glass, right? Maybe two police officers on one side, one perp on the other side, right? I think we all sort of have the same picture. So raise your hand. So everyone. So who was able to accurately sort of portray a police interrogation? Okay, who's been involved in a police interrogation? <laughs> So why do we all have such a clear image of what happens in a police interrogation room? I would, I would surmise, and I sort of suggest, that it's because we've seen it so many times on television, right? So we know that there's this sort of, you know, we, we sort of know the dynamic, right? We know that the police might occasionally engage in some deceptive police and um, tactics, but ultimately, the guilty person's going to confess whatever they did. That person was absolutely guilty. They'll confess. And this will be, a, you know, the, the little lapses in, in police procedure will sort of ultimately um, reveal the truth of the incident, right? Now I want you to picture um, someone being pulled over by a police officer in their car for speeding. You probably picture something a little bit different. You might have sort of imagined some of the nerves you get. I mean, if, you know, when you, when you see the siren going off, right, you know you haven't done anything wrong or maybe you're not sure whether you've done anything wrong. Um, but you're pretty sure that this is not going to be a pleasant um, interaction with a police officer, right? No matter how sure you are that, that you weren't actually breaking the law, 
you still are probably afraid of what that police officer is going to say. And we don't put that same mental image in the typical confession, right? Because we don't portray a lot of um, people being pulled over by the police on TV, but we do um, portray a lot of police investigations, right? So we have more personal understanding of certain kinds of reaction to police officers um, from our own lives, but we have a very different understanding of them on popular culture, right? And so one of the things that I've been looking at um, recently is the effect of counter narratives on our understanding of um, police confessions and their reliability, right? So, so as you know, traditionally, um, police investigations have been um, thrown out if the police um, did something horribly wrong, right? So if they abused um, the person that they were interviewing, um, if there was something um, problematic constitutionally about um, their tactics, but we never investigate how reliable those confessions are on a daily basis, right? So we've never, we've never looked in, um, in a large set of data about whether or not when people um, confess, whether those confessions have any um, trace of reality. And I wanna argue that part of our understanding of these confessions is based in the media, right? Um, and so we can think about, so I'm, I'm gonna say that most of my work in storytelling has to do more with um, narratology. So I, I work a lot with the, um, with the work of Paul Ricoeur, um, who's been influential in how I think of the world. But one of his um, central tenets is that we understand the world around us through story, right? There's no other way that we understand it that cause and effect are mere sort of um, mind tricks for us to make sense of our world, right? That they don't exist in the way that we think that they do. So we sort of post hoc rationalize what has happened to us. Um, and we also, there's a lot of other sort of mental tricks that we do that play into this. So um, for example, you may be familiar with the fundamental attribution error, which says that we understand that the things that we do are highly influenced by what goes on around us, but we tend to think that other people do things because they are morally good or morally bad, right? And so when all of these sorts of um, psychological components that we, we, we know to be fundamentally true to the human experience, when they come together, it means that we're much more likely to attribute um, a confession as being a truthful admission of what someone knows to have happened, right? Even though we all are always making things up all the time, right? That is, that is sort of how we make sense of the world. And so in this sense, um, we can see police confessions and their portrayal um, on both TV and also in media more generally as a way to tell a cohesive story, right? So we, we see confessions much more often um, when they're portrayed on, um, in, for example, police procedurals than they actually happen in real life because that makes such a satisfying end to the story, right? So once someone confesses, we know that we got the right person, right? So, so there, no more question. And so because of that, the flip happens, right? When we hear that someone confesses, we, something in our, in our brain sort of clicks and says, oh, well, we, they must have gotten the right guy, right? And so we don't question it. That's, that's actually the climax of the story. We're not gonna question, we're not gonna go back and relitigate that part, right? So this is part of where I think our understanding of what the law is on television really impacts, for example, what we consider evidence. Um, we're just starting to roll back um, things like, we, we know that eyewitness testimony is inherently unreliable. Um, and I've been working with some psychologists um, at LSU, um, problematically, it's, it's, been, it's been a hard road, um, but to figure out how reliable confessions are. Um, but I think it's gonna be a really um, big hump to, to work over because we have this feeling from the way that they've been described on TV that they are reliable. If, and they are reliable unless, um, unless the police did something, um, you know, untoward towards the, um, to, to the suspect. So I will say, that's, that's part of a longer piece, but I want to fast forward to say that there's also promise in things like documentaries. Um, I think it's a little bit ironic that I'm asked to be on this panel only because if, my students know this, I know no pop culture. I, I, <laughs> I never watched TV. I used to work. I used to work for a company where part of my job was to watch TV. That's about the only TV I've ever seen in my life, right? So I'm just not a. I know it's embarrassing. I'm not a pop, pop culture person. Um, I have, as a result of some of my research, watched NCIS, Bull, and um, I did actually used to watch Law and Order, but I pulled some of those out too, right? Um, I 
like every lawyer in the world, I have watched Law and Order. But this is my understanding of what police procedurals look like. Um, but anyways, but the good news is I did watch Making a Murderer when it came out. Um, and so that was the first time I saw a police interrogation room that did not have a cold, hard sort of metal table, right? Where it looked like someone's living room, um, which actually portrays a much more sort of normal, that's actually a little bit more common, right? That, that instead of trying to be um, bad cop, good cop, everyone's trying to be good cop, right? It's part of, it's part of what is in um, sort of the training for interrogators. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with being a good cop, right? But yet they still elicit um, false confessions. Um, and so we've seen this um, from things like Making a Murderer. And I always say, I watched Central Park Five, but that was the Ken Burns one. There's also one that I did not watch. They see us. They see us. Um, so, so these sorts of documentaries are actually being um, cited um, in this current legislation now um, to protect vulnerable suspects. Um, so it's usually, um, for example, minors, right? But we are starting to see the fact that that when confessions come to full light, right, when we really see how these interrogations work in real life and that people will potentially falsely confess and we can see their stories, um, that we are starting to see the, the fallibility of these police tactics. So there are some, at least, um, good results. But I was really interested, I'm just gonna, one last point before I, I turn it over, and I wanted to um, bring in a point um, that Professor Robbins um, made, which is that, um, Part of, I think, that the um, way that these um, reforms have been enacted really relies on the innocence character, right? So we are really protecting people. We are, we are only looking for minors, right? Um, we are really protecting people who we think are so innocent um, in sort of the, the simple, right? Their, their, their minds are just not complicated. Um, we are, that's the only group that we're, we're looking to protect. And until I heard you talk about that, it frustrated me because I thought, well, this is a psychological phenomenon that happens across the board. You don't have to be under 26 for, for your brain to sort of want to um, confess to things that you haven't done. Um, but I think maybe that's, I'm, 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 that's really given me something to think about, about how much we really want people to be 100% innocent rather than just not guilty. All right, that's my part. All right. Well, unlike my esteemed colleagues, I don't even need a microphone, sorry. I am a pop culture junkie. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but I do, I do appreciate lots of different kinds of pop culture, lots of different kinds of media, lots of different kinds of social media. And in thinking about that, what I prepared today is now also going to be a little bit different after hearing from my esteemed colleagues. Because I came prepared to talk about three different ways pop culture changes the law. Procedural substantive and in terms of identity or professional responsibility. You've talked about the difference between procedural law and substantive law. Procedural law are those laws that we use to, no, no, okay, you will. To carry, <laughs> procedural laws are those laws that we use to carry out other laws, like evidence rules or um, rules of civil procedure. And there's lots of those that have changed procedurally since I went to law school 150 years ago. Um, specifically, we didn't, I went to law school and I started writing at a time when we didn't have podcasts. Now, if you want to use a podcast and you want to write about it and you want to cite to it in a brief, you want to cite to it in an article, how do you cite it? We well, go to the blue book and there's a rule on it. And there's a rule on all kinds. If I have a client and they've got, it's in there, trust me. If I've got a client and they've got a TikTok and they've taken their TikTok and they've created a revenge TikTok and everything on their TikTok. Sorry, I'm so loud. Sorry, I'm so loud. I get excited, Professor. So you've got to, how do you get the TikTok into evidence? How do you authenticate that? So a lot of our procedural rules have to change over time when we get new pieces of pop culture or when some become much more uh, popular than other ones. The second type is substantive. So our substantive law gets changed through pop culture. As we've talked already, pop culture is our culture. It is who we are. And I remember not long ago, um, it was during the beginning of the pandemic, there was a story going around on Facebook and Instagram about pelvic exams. And it was news to most of us that across the country, you could go in for an appendectomy or a hernia repair, and if you were at a teaching hospital, an intern could have given you a pelvic exam and you didn't specifically consent to that, 
and you didn't uh, know what happened. And men, you are not a, a, a above this either. They're reading prostate exams on men without their knowledge either. Because that story was so widely circulated at the beginning of the pandemic when no one left their houses and all we had was social media, that's changed. And that's changed in every state across the country through legislation that legislators wouldn't have cared about had pop culture not picked up on that story. As of last year, there were two holdouts, Missouri and Kansas. Missouri signed their law banning this procedure into effect in July of 2023. Kansas is the lone holdout. There was a bill introduced, but it died in committee. So we have this ex great example of how pop culture has a story. It tells it to people who care about it, who, who do nothing but care about it and talk about it in their constituents of legislators who end up listening. And in my mind, that's very validating. These are all sorts of things that we would like to change in the law. And specifically, the thing that I wanted to add to this is the discussion of research. You were talking about Breonna Taylor. I remember looking at pop culture and looking at Facebook and, and Instagram around the time that the protests here started. My friends were in those protests. And what I remember very specifically is a friend of mine named Jake who was on the front lines and got hit with rubber bullets by the police. And I remember the image on, I'll never forget it, the image of his back covered with these big welts because he was trying to get justice. That made me want to write about it. And so the article that I wrote last year was started with that and how do we get local governments the ability to change their policies when the state government is hostile to that. You all know what happened with the state government and, and how little justice was seen. Um, but those sorts of things we know about through pop culture. Um, I didn't leave the house very much during the pandemic. I had a small child at home. I sewed a lot of masks and I gave them to the people who were doing those protests and it inspired me to do something that I could with my time. Um, and the, so we've got procedural changes. We certainly have these substantive changes. And I think pop culture sometimes accomplishes those things that we cannot do. I don't think that, I don't think a hundred phone calls to my legislator would have changed that law. But when it blew up and it was all over social media and all over pop culture for so many months and, and people across the country were just very upset about this thing that was happening, that changed it. The last thing that I sort of have seen in the law in terms of its response to pop culture is the difference in how we can express our professional identity in terms of professional responsibility. Mark started, he said, he talked about pop culture as an agent of chaos. I think when I graduated law school, there is no way I would have ever bought the skirt that I'm wearing today. I would never have worn it into, I'll just stand up. I would never have worn this to a courtroom. In fact, I'm certain. I'm certain, it's just, it was thrifted, it's fine. Um, I'm certain that I never would have gotten the advice as a, as a 3L to go put this skirt on and go to an interview or go to court. Um, I would now, I'm a little bit, a lot older. Um, but I think personal identity has changed a little bit. Um, over the course of this past year, I've met a lot of legal professionals from across the country. Um, and I met a dean of a law school who had blue hair. She was no less a dean, in fact, probably more of it because she was able to express that personal identity. That wouldn't have happened 20 years ago. It wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. Um, I've met, uh, I did, when I was teaching last year, I did some interviews with uh, local professionals about litigating high-profile cases. One of them had a, a front office staff who was covered in visible tattoos and had green hair. That was that person's professional identity, and pop culture has made that more acceptable, and it's made it more acceptable in our field as well, within reason. Obviously, there are, there are cultural barriers to a lot of this, and there are uh, class barriers and all sorts of things, and you're gonna get the same advice I did 20 years ago, wear dark colors and don't be flashy and all of that. But over time, it's been nice to see, at least from seasoned professionals, sort of an eye towards this difference in professional identity and the way that you present yourself and you can still be professional and still have some identity to, to who you are and what you look like as a person. That, that didn't happen at all years ago. And that's because we see it in pop culture. We see things, we see tattoos differently than we did. We see different hair colors differently. We see hot pink leopard print differently than we did 20 years ago. Um, how and why? This happens because, as we've said before, stories matter. 
and our pop stories are our stories. They matter because they're invasive. You can't wake up in the morning and turn your cell phone without getting a, a dash of pop culture, or at least most of us can. They are interesting. We are interested in the stories that we hear in pop culture, pop culture a lot more than when you're sitting in a classroom learning about Ms. Paul's graph getting injured by a scale from 1921. They're interesting, and so they speak to us because they capture our attention, they capture our emotions, and then they move us to action. And pop culture is more than just pop. It's more than just um, entertainment. It does a lot for us because it is us, and it shapes the, the, uh, the law in a lot of these areas. So, Oh, the other, last thing, I'm sorry. Uh, in terms of being a pop culture junkie, I'm also a, a, a low-grade TikTok addict. And the thing that I've noticed with um, personal identity, there is a TikToker, if you haven't seen her, her name is Brandis Bradley. She's from Eastern Rural Kentucky. She went to law school, and she decided to go back to Eastern Rural Kentucky and be a lawyer in her hometown. Half of her TikTok is on Britney Spears, and it's phenomenal because she's worried for Britney, and she, she calls her sissy cat, and she'll get a big cake out, and she'll eat this cake while she talks about Britney's latest escapades. The other half of her TikTok is about practicing law in rural Kentucky, and she has this wonderful practice where she is helping the people that she grew up with, and she is managing to have it both ways. She is herself. She is talking about fun things, uh, about maybe 20% of her channel is makeup tutorials, which is also kind of fun. Um, but she is a professional like any other. She knows how to turn things on and uh, how, to, how to tone switch when she goes into court. She's an advocate. She's a human. And everything she does in the social media uh, sphere is just so compelling. And I am amplified and, and just happy that that's where the profession has come and that's where we're going. So thank you. I think it, it's twofold. So one, those of us who've been practicing a little bit know, the law is typically the last thing to change. Um, and so when you talk about practicing, um, it has been relatively behind the eight ball in what we do with technology. That is, how does social media get in? How, whether it's in a criminal case for harassment or terroristic threatening, how do you authenticate the information? Our, our rules of evidence still have not truly caught up with it. Um, and so you're getting a lot of judges, some judges who have been on the bench for a while still may not be very 
in tune with what really happens on social media. So they don't know what to do when they get the, this is my inbox that, you know, um, they may be swayed by someone saying, oh, no, that wasn't me. I was hot with all of this information versus really going through, well, show me that you were hot. Like, how did you, you know, what did you do to, to get unhacked? Or, or um, but then when we, we, we've talked about social media, but when you talk about the various apps, cell phone apps, pop culture, cell phones are crazy now. But so the law has been very slow to catch up. Um, and I think especially with the generative AI information coming out, it's not just about what information you can get from these apps, um, but what information, what information is legitimate, what information is correct. We saw the, the every practicing lawyer and future lawyer should have been horrified by the lawyer that submitted the brief with wrong, like not even real case names. Um, and so to, to the ethics question that came up earlier, um, when it comes to technology, I, I think in terms of outside of substantive law changes, your procedural law uh, changes, your evidence rules, your rules of civil procedure outside of you can now file electronically, which you cannot do when I first started practicing. Um, outside of you can now file electronically, I just think the, the profession as a whole has a lot to catch up with. We were forced to do more because of COVID than we've ever done in terms of technology and, and practicing law. I think it, it also in terms of your question about cinema and how media affects trial presentation. The one thing that does concern me specifically now is the, and it's been, a, it's been a little while since I've been inside a courtroom, is the attention span of jurors. So our social media has changed. I mean, you, you were mentioning cinema, you know, an hour and a half movie from 20 years ago. Now we have all these bite-sized sort, sorts of pieces of information because that's what we have time for. How does that affect a juror's attention span? Do we need to start breaking those, our information up into smaller pieces when we present it at trial so that we keep the attention? Um, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but it would be an interesting topic to write on. Um, it would concern me going back into the courtroom now. It would concern me not having any media whatsoever. I can't imagine. I was a prosecutor for about 10 years. It would, I would be much more likely to use multimedia presentations than just a PowerPoint, and I would be much more likely to cut them down into smaller bite-sized pieces because of the influence of today's social media. I'm not sure I have much to add, um, just that I do think, so there's been research into just sort of the problem that we have um, with the proliferation of so many multiple um, media sources, and again, social media, all sorts of media, of just understanding what's reliable. And I think that that sort of problem with understanding reliability, um, I can't imagine doesn't factor into courtrooms as well, right? Um, that we might be more, so we talk about internally or externally constructed ethos, right? So, um, you know, for example, when um, we have an expert witness, we have to go through this these series of questions to certify them as an expert, right? Where did you go to school? What did you do, right? What causes you to be an expert? Um, but I think we're less likely to be swayed by those sorts of criteria anymore because all of all of our ethos um, we see is sort of internally um, constructed. So we trust this person on um, TikTok to show us how to do makeup because she's wearing good makeup, right? Um, and so um, we do have a very different sort of sense of how we trust um, the information that we're receiving. So I could imagine, I don't, I don't know about this, but I would imagine that that would um, really influence the way that we understand evidence that's um, given at trials as well. I think now, because there's so much exposure, um, Mark touched on it a bit, and you try to get a, a, a jury that's not heard back. Your case is taken out the bed, but it, it's hard to do that now, whether it's because of social media, regular news, podcasts. You, you try to do that. So I think now we've gone from a trying to get jurors who, who knew very little about your case to how do we minimize the effect of the information we've gotten. So in terms of presenting a case, you're, you're trying to exclude people who know way too much and really don't know what they think they know too much and they really don't know anything. So you try to keep those people off 
but to the effect, to the to the extent that they do make it onto a jury, and you have to assume that they do. I don't think anyone can assume that you get everybody that you want off. You really, in the presentation of your evidence, have to minimize the effect of how much you're going to hold your people down. If you think about it, how many of you have heard that Brooks Hauk got arrested and that Nick might be next by, by now? How many of you have heard about that? If you've heard about it, how many of you have heard on social media? I mean, so that's going to affect, I mean, that you're, uh, that's a, uh, exactly what you're saying, and it's, it's happening right now, and one of them isn't even arrested yet, but we've, most of us have heard that, read that article within the last couple of days. That's Crystal Rogers, yeah. So it, it goes around so, so quickly that you can't, it's harder to, to put a, a head on it. I'm going to take the first half of that because I think I think that's partially answered by the types of social media we have now. Small sound bites, right? But on a social media platform like TikTok, someone comes up and says something, then the anybody who sees it, if their algorithm is is craft is crafted to see it, has the ability to duet or stitch it. So when I see a social justice issue on TikTok, because my, my algorithm has been curated the way that I am interested, the things that I'm interested in, I'll see the same issue 12 times. And I'll see it over and over and over again. So it's a small sound bite, but that repetition, I'll see, and I'll see multiple takes on it. Now they'll both be with my very leftist sense of, of, of social justice. But part of that's good and part of that's bad, but I think with these small sound bites and the way that social justice, that even a Facebook feed, if you think about it, if you have friends or even um, businesses you're following that post a certain thing, you see it over and over and over and over again. So the depth it might not be there, but the breadth certainly is. And I think that just the way that social media has been so pervasive and the, and the way that it's crafted gives us that repetition, which I think addresses some of what you're saying. Substance, I think, is what's lacking. I, and I don't know the answer to that. So I think I was going to pick up on a, a different strain, potentially, and I'm not even sure that this was entirely your question, so forgive me, um, but when I think about, um, for example, counterpublics and some of the work that um, Michael Warner's done on counterpublics and sort of raising a counter discourse to the level that it sort of becomes a discourse, right? Um, and I think about some of the work that, for example, Richard Delgado has done with his storytelling and his Rodrigo stories, um, or some of the work that has been done in social media about, for example, you know, um, black boys getting the talk, right? Um, girls getting the talk about how to protect yourself in a, um, in a parking lot, right? And these sorts of um, individualized stories that become, you know, they get told, they, they have a sense of truth to them, we all understand that they sort of affect our lives and they become, they become a more dominant narrative, right? Um, and so I think that there's this interesting mix between, you know, the power of one story to provide an example, but then when that get raised, when that get raises, right, to, to the form of a more dominant discourse um, that resonates with more and more people, um, that we do start to see um, a bit more change. So I think it's a little bit of both of those. Um, I'll also say, um, so I've been doing a project, um, um, a, a couple of projects, um, 
um, about storytelling that I, that I think um, really do have some of the, I think this is a really interesting time to raise counter narratives um, because I think people are especially willing to listen to them right now. And I, I have to go back. I don't have it exactly. I don't have that quote memorized yet. But the quote that I had in my PowerPoint about affecting change, there has to be constant communication. And so when you ask how much, I say as much as we need to affect the change that needs to happen or, or what is it that you're trying to uh, impact. Now, in saying that, I would be lying if I didn't acknowledge as a former prosecutor, as a former um, public defender, that with that messaging and that counter messaging, a person's right to a fair trial is being impacted because you are, your whole goal is to reach potential jurors, the juror pool. Um, and if the more that is out there, which is to get the change that you want to get, the more that your potential jurors are hearing it. And as I teach in evidence class all the time, once you hear something, a limited, instru <laughs> limited instruction, you got to ask for it. But once a jury hears it, they've heard it. You can't unhear uh, what you've already heard. You can't unsee. Once you have a, um, the, the version of the story that you believe to be true, um, you know, that, that's your version of the story. And it is hard to undo that belief. So while as an attorney, I want my message out there as much and as far wide as I can, because at this point, that's what it's about now. With mm -hmm. the, the pop culture is, pick, is picking these things up, so I need my story out there, God forbid, and get it out there before a judge gives a gag order. You know, I don't even, I've never, I've, I've not had, no one on Brianna's case asked for a gag order, believe it or not. That's so, shocking. Yeah, no one asked for a gag order. Um, and so, <laughs> but, and then I also recognize the importance of when I have um, celebrities that are willing to take on that cause, there's stuff they can say that I would simply not say as an attorney. Mm -hmm. And so, by all means, I have other people to say, this is it. This is what I w would like for you to say if you're willing to say it. Yeah. And, they go out there and say it. So how much until you start to see the change that you want to see, but it does um, have an impact on an, a, a, an individual's right to have a, a trial, a jury who are hearing and seeing the evidence for the first time and making their decision on the evidence that's presented in the courtroom. And I think that's a great example of how we can use things like social media to affect change, whether it's in maybe not even in an individual case, because the other half of the question was about the system, systemic change. And I think if we encourage the appropriate use of social media by more and more legislators, judges, you'd be kind of, there's lots of attorneys who use it for marketing, lots of attorneys who use it for marketing, and they get, um, little clips of the law, you know, what the law is on a certain subject that are, you know, real pop culture interesting. Um, and then I've seen judges campaign on social media as well, on TikTok of all things. How do we use that to evoke, ch to, to, to create change, to create more knowledge about what the justice system does because the average citizen doesn't know? Uh, there's lots of legislators who use it for that purpose as well. There's um, a guy in North Carolina named Jackson, Jeff Jackson, he, he just sits and he just talks in this real, real soft voice and he tells you what happened in Congress today. And he's real, he's, he's just the guy you'd, you'd want to have a beer with. He's just a great, a great guy. And is he affecting change in his district? Probably. Is he going to use TikTok to get votes? I hope so, because the man's, he's just real, you've seen him. He's, he's kind of, he's just, he is a legislator coming down to our level and saying, I'm going to have a conversation with you, and it's going to be effective. Can we use that for systemic change? I think so.
if an attorney is doing it, I think you have legislation in your professional rules, so I'll put that out there for that. Um, because you can't just make statements that are completely contradictory to the fact. So if, if there were a deep fake of a, of a lawyer, and, and so, so it makes it to po the popular media. But it's coming from someone, right? It's coming from someone, that person's got a UPI charge. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's unauthorized practice of law. So if it's, if someone creates a deep fake, whether if it's an attorney, you, you're gonna have your license problems, but if it's, you're not an attorney, that's a misdemeanor in most states, a felony, depending on what happens. So we do have some of that legislation. I think your question is, is great in terms of evidence. How do we, how do the evidentiary rules need to change to address when we have a deep fake that wants to be introduced into a court hearing? And how do we educate a judge who, who prints out all of their emails to, who, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> no. Well, I think the big issue though, more, so we've talked about it, and, and Professor Powell asked how much. I said as much. You touched on it a little bit with false information, possibly. And right now, it's the, is there a way to curb false information, misinformation, lies, wrong information? Like, is there a way to curb that without also infringing on people's First Amendment? And that's where technology and the laws have not caught up because it's like, oh, we want people to be able to say what they want to say, even if it's not true, if it's just dead dog wrong, like people, and, and that's the dangers of pop culture, social media, influencers, this influence, and I, like, I, 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 I don't post on TikTok, but I go down to TikTok Same. rabbit holes. Same. Um, but um, the danger is I consider myself wise and I, I go, like if I'm like, oh, that sounds, before I reshare anything, I'm like, let me see if that really happened. But I recognize that not everyone does that. And I, there's friends who are attorneys that I call it like, hey, take that down, that doesn't really happen. <laughs> um, and so it, it's how do you contain and control misinformation and I just, I, I, I don't, I wish I had the answer for it. There was a recent study, and this is going to scare the older people in the room and not surprise the younger people in the room, that the first place that um, I think hopefully younger than you all um, go for information is not to Google, it's to TikTok, um, right? Which is not an information source, obviously, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, I know, right? The older folks are like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I cringe. Like, when I was getting ready to say to Google, I'm like, no, but I, can't, I don't even stop at Google. I got to keep going. Right? Yeah. So... So yeah, the sort of the sort of where do we get our information has been shifting dramatically, right? Well, I, I, can I just add to that? Yeah, yeah. I know I'm just talking. Oh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> this has historically been the critique of pop culture for over seventy years, right? Um, the, the so it, it's on the one hand, at least people who try to recuperate or try to uh, um, they see the promise of of pop culture as. A, the possibility of more democratic ways of communicating, right? That's that's always what that has been. And then on the other side, the critique has always been a sort of anti-intellectualist critique that like it it's dumbed down form of communication, right? And we hear about this with like oh face to face versus um, online versus social media, you know, or truncated amount of actual language you can use in in certain formats. But this. Before fake news, there was yellow journalism. So there are always new forms that come out in, in popular culture a lot. Uh, and we think of it as new and unprecedented, but it's, it's, you know, taking a historical perspective, we see that this is just a dance that we do. Older generations versus newer generations, um, tradition versus progress. That, that, that sort of encapsulates, I think, like the so problem of, of pop culture. So I would just, I, I agree with that. I think, I think you're right that it's not maybe so much a problem with the medium um, as sort of our traditional um, gatekeeping functions that we think, right? So in other words, um, I know people who got their news from the weekly world news, right? So we have known forever that there were um, news sources, but they were a little bit easier to ferret out if you were willing to do that work. Um, but I, I agree that the sort of democratization um, can be interesting, but I think there's also, it's also hard to deny that we're in a sort of 
I mean, people keep on calling it the post-truth era, right? Um, and so I think that's a hard thing to, to unconnect, that we are in something a little bit more special here. I mean, I think it's been great for, um, I think the, the fact that people can self-publish has been great for music, but I don't know how great it is for the news when we're not doing investigative reporting anymore. I am one of those older people you mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, and that statistic doesn't scare me at all because I think in a, in you know Marcus was talking about um, it's it's just a different kind of media, and we've always sort of had these issues, but it kind of depends on the issue, I guess. If I want a quick answer to what I want to cook for dinner tonight, TikTok has the right answer and it's accurate, um, and it's usually it's usually go get delivery, but. <laughs> So, it's, but, but that's not that's not inherently wrong or inherently untrue simply because it's on this media. Just like Wikipedia, I've, used, I've with my students for years, I've I've allowed them to start there because that's curated at the bottom. You have all the links to the real stuff. What what worries me is that we have I think so many more people who are not willing to verify, who are not willing, or who don't know how to. You're right. The proliferation of of fake media goes far beyond this, but it's don't, don't shoot the messenger, just get your message right. I agree, I'd actually argue that Wikipedia is more reliable than a lot of sources because yeah. it is so vetted, right, because of that way. But again, that's the sort of problem with one person without sort of the backing of someone else who's said, hey, we think this is verifiable, right, and just sort of that, yeah, yeah, that system, absolutely. right. So I think part of the key, especially for students, is that because of this proliferation of, of a different or unique professional identity and that being more okay, it allows you to make better decisions about what you want to do with your career. Because 25 years ago, when I first started, when I got my first job, everybody dressed the same. And there was no expression and there was no difference. And I, I remember it was a big deal that my roommate got a suit that had embroidery on the collar because that was unprofessional. Um, and so I think that you can use that to figure out where you really will be a good fit when you make hire, when you make decisions on where, what you wanna, where you wanna go, what you wanna do. I think that in terms of um, how it's used between us as lawyers when we're talking you know, outside of court or things like that, it does allow for some more collegiality but, but it also can allow for separation. You're always gonna have those people in a firm or in a law, in a law office that still do print out their emails and they think very um, poorly about social media. But that's life. And I think that if you can use it to create collegiality in a firm, two days ago, I saw a TikTok on inductive versus deductive reasoning and I immediately sent it to all my students because I thought they would get it. This guy was a Yale grad, it's called Black Academics. If you see the channel, he's fantastic. And he talks about you know race and academics, but his little lesson was fantastic. Find what works for you. If that allows you to be collegial with someone across the aisle that you've been in a, you know, a, a, a trial with, can you, you know, I was gonna swear, but I won't. You can, you can, you can, cur you can talk uh, in, in about the small de details of your day using social media. You can use it to advertise. It's about, I think, curating what it can do for you over time. Um, and it does allow us to be collegial. It'll, I, I, I send memes and TikToks to my legal friends all the time um, because that's my love language, so. And the only thing I'll add to, because I think it's, like, she's right. When I graduated from here, 
16 and a half years ago, I won't say that, yeah, I would not have, and even probably up until about eight years ago, I would not be here in my Brianna Taylor shirt and jeans if I'm on a panel. I would have been dressed up before. However, to, I say that and I'm here, I'm not, I'm probably going to, if I'm in trial, I'm probably going to have on my navy suit when I go to trial. Um, so it's, it, the time and place just like everywhere. But on a general everyday basis, the last place that I worked pre-COVID, I could wear whatever I want. So if I felt like wearing sweatpants, I could. Now, do, did I go to depositions with sweatpants on? No. Did I dress him? I, I probably would have had, like, again, not necessarily a navy with black or anything like that. Um, so it's just time and place. But you have to, so there's the, the individual freedoms that you do get, and it, it's our profession has become a lot more like than it was, um, again, even 10 years ago. However, in saying that, there's still things that you don't want that 80-year-old woman on a jury to look at you and be like, mm. and then they're taking your appearance out on your client, and that does happen. I have people, I, I like designer purses. You would never see me carry a designer purse into a jury trial because the jury's like, oh, they don't need any money. Look at that lawyer. <laughs> you know, like, you just, it's just those little tips, but those are also tips that I got not from law school, but from mentors. Like, you don't go to trial with red bottom shoes on. Everyone loves red bottoms, but don't wear red bottom shoes. <laughs> to, 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 to a trial. You can go to court if you want to. They hurt. I wouldn't go to court in them. But you definitely don't stand up in a trial. I'm going to bring this here, but not trial. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those are those things that, especially, I, I, I speak from a woman's perspective, trial attorney, sorry, man. Mark can give you the trial on what you guys wear and don't wear. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but just so. But notice he said he saw his jury before he decided yeah. not to. <laughs> so. Um, so, um, thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. We do have um, a reception upstairs um, in the Cox Lounge, so basically if you could go Kitty Pride style up through the ceiling, you would be there. Um, but, um, <laughs> that's an X-Men reference. I'm not sure! Um, so, um, <laughs> what I will say is, um, thank you for coming. I wanted to thank all, again, our keynote speaker, Dan Robbins. I want to thank all our panelists, our moderators. I want to thank the staff that put this together. You saw Jimmy West, who's been here, what, a month? And he's coming in and out and fixing every little tech thing that we have. Stephen Durham, our new um, um, assistant dean of um, IT, has been working. We, you know, it took a village. Tracy Cole is the one made sure that everyone had coffee, which you will not leave in this room. <laughs> I want, you better Boy Scout this place. I want it way nicer than you found it. Okay. Um, but Tracy Cole um, and then uh, Kyle Durbin, who put together all our graphics and everything. And, and everyone, every staff member in this building, we are small but mighty. And they all work so hard. And I appreciate everyone for pulling this all together and creating this for um, our students, our faculty, um, and all our guests. So thank you again, everyone. Please come upstairs. Thank you.